All right, so welcome everybody. This is our, um, I think, second session in the second half of this book. Uh, it should be our last one. Um, we're dealing with uh, the second half of um, Heidegger's interpretation of the Theotetus. Um, this is the part that's dealing with um, uh, the idea of knowledge as right opinion. Um, it starts with this sec uh, chapter three section on question concerning the essence of untruth. That's the framing he's giving to this uh, whole second half. Um, uh, well, that's that's the whole second half. The The part we're, we're doing though is the second answer, which is starting here. So um, uh, episteme as aletheus doxa, uh, true opinion, right opinion. Um, so uh, uh, that's where the reading is gonna be. We also could have some time at the end to sum up um, what we think of the the whole book, the whole cycle, uh, everything from the um, first half and um, Allegory of the Cave Republic uh, uh, stuff and also the Theotetus stuff. Uh, and then toward the end, we might also talk about what we wanna do next. We talked about that some some last time. We got some um, some pretty good uh, recommendations actually from both Pete and Dan. Um, uh, Dan kind of recommended this book, which is uh, definitely uh, a good one to do. Um, it, it's sort of about, um, uh, wonder as the basis of the experience of philosophy or the philosophical life, something like that, um, which is a good continuation to the essence of truth stuff we're just doing right now. Um, and then uh, I had uh, discussed possibly doing either early Greek thinking or some of the things out of the question concerning technology, which Pete points out are, are uh, collected along with some other things in a, in a book of essays in German that's translated into different books in English. And we might try to do that whole set of things. Um, and I'm open to you guys' uh, opinions on what those things to do next. Um, I had some of my own ideas about things to do next, but they're a little bit too far afield, I think. Um, and uh, we should probably stick with more of the continuation on Heidegger because I think we haven't gotten, gotten all the way. Joe, question? I am interested in sticking with Heidegger, so I'm not contradicting anybody. But I must say that um, uh, just for reading material, since I'm doing more reading these weeks than uh, last year, uh, I've, I've opened up Popper, Karl Popper, uh, Conjectures and Refutations, mm -hmm. which is sort of a lifetime collection of it, all of his writings, a very thick book. Yep. And I, I find that he's discussing things like reality. And uh, the, I'm surprised that so many of the topics that we're discussing here uh, have an overlap there. Uh, you know, yep. And I'm really enjoying reading Popper. Uh, it's always nice to discuss books. I'm not trying to, to urge anybody, but I understand. Uh, I, I've got that book, and it's part of like three a three volume thing of a bunch of his uh, main stuff, um, uh, which is quite good. But uh, it's pretty far afield from the trajectory we're on right now. I mean, I I, I agree there is some overlap. I'm, I'm aware of that. Period. I'm not trying um, to push anybody. Yeah. You know? um, the the other book I was thinking of, uh, it's something I've been reading recently, is um, this one, uh, Plato's Critique of Impure Reason, and the reason for it is one way of looking at it is it's an attempt to um, interpret the Republic kind of along the lines of the road not taken, uh, Heidegger mentions at the end of this one. Um, but uh, I think that uh, that may be too, too much a distraction for other people here who are still um, coming to grips with Heidegger and their position on Heidegger and trying to understand all of that. Um, so it may be better to have um, more of the full view of Heidegger under our belt before we talk about any kind of um, reactions or critiques of it. So um, that might be premature is what I'm trying to say. So maybe we come back to that when we want to read the Republic. Um, but I am interested in other people's uh, opinions on that. Um, besides the basic questions, um, uh, either the, some of the stuff in early Greek thinking or the stuff in the question concerning technology could, are other obvious things to do next. Um, the one I prepared the most is from the questions concerning technology. It's the, uh, the word of Nietzsche essay there. Um, when I say prepared the most, I mean, I'm the most ready for it. If we started it tomorrow, I could you know, be teaching about it. Um, uh, any of the others, uh, I would do a little bit more work. Um, the early Greek thinking is probably the one I'm next most prepared for. Um, but that's uh, my own considerations. Uh, I want to hear you guys at the end. Anyway, that's just stuff about we can get to at the end about what people want to do next. Um, uh, in the meantime, let's get our first round robin of who managed to do the reading and first impressions and so forth. <laughs> Carlos, do you want to start us off? Sure, I did do the reading actually as usual twice, once to read it and the second time to write questions and comments. <clears throat> it's inevitable to think that probably Plato and since Plato or even before then until now, we've been dealing with the same thing, we call now 
fake news and alternative facts. And he seems to allude to, well, at least Heidegger does, that uh, it was a pretty interesting reading, by the way. On page 226, he actually says, pure facts do not exist at the bottom of the page. And to me, that was, uh, I wouldn't say revealing, it was consonant with, what, with what's going on in our world now. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's trying to he's trying to say something like that. It has it has to be uh, comprehended in in a in a background with an with an, an importance, uh, et cetera. That, that there's a, a um, uh, theory and phenomena around it. Um, it's not an isolated fact, um, but uh, there's a, also a place that that holds in the in the overall discussion here when we're we're moving to uh, we're talking about the logos character of doxa or something like that. Um, uh, and there's the question of um, if reasoning and phenomena seem to contradict each other, which one do you adhere to most? Um, and uh, uh, here he's describing how the turn the dialogue takes is because we have to adhere to the phenomena, we have to listen to the phenomena. Um, uh, but he quotes uh, in the other direction a statement of Hegel's "all the worse for the facts," meaning that sometimes you know the the consistency of the theory overrides the facts, so to speak. Um, but uh, that's sort of the, the, the problematic he's discussing there. But I think we should, to see that in context, we should, we should uh, uh, see where that comment uh, lies in the whole course of the argument. I don't think it's central to the argument he's, uh, he's trying to make here. Um, but uh, certainly it's a, it's a contrast to uh, like the first, the first sentence of the, uh, um, the Tractatus, so if you think of Wittgenstein, you know, the world consists of facts is the you know, first line of his, you know, early positivist view. Um, this is not that view. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we can talk about that, but keep going, Carlos. You know, in essence, <clears throat> in essence my, uh, my overall take on the whole reading is that it underscores the idea that <sighs> You have to think about things before you come to the conclusion that they are what they what you think they are. Um, and you know, I can elaborate on that, but I'll be saying the same thing with different words. Uh, it's um, very illuminating. It's not only thoughts. You can also begin to question uh, the basis of emotions and feelings mm -hmm. based on the same uh, line of reasoning, if you can call it reasoning, this line of uh, inquiry. Uh, at any rate, um, I'm tempted to read it again, but I don't think I will have the time. I mean, myself. <laughs> on top of the next, next assignment, I'd have to read this again, but it's, it bears another reading with uh, even more uh, detailed scrutiny. Yeah, most of these things do. I mean, there's a point point in the uh, um, late in the in, in our current part where Heidegger uh, um, says that a platonic dialogue with Theotetus is inexhaustible, which might be a slight exaggeration, but it certainly has been exhausted yet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, you, could, you could continue picking at details and, and, and you can continue picking at it and derive some benefit from it in terms of uh, the insights that you can glean from uh, further readings. Yeah, if you, if you bring the right stance to it, I would agree. Um, okay, uh, uh, Joe, you wanna take go next? <clears throat> I have to get off mute first. So I have to find my button first. <clears throat> well, very good. Uh, as far as completing uh, this uh, session's readings, I only did about 20%, uh, and I regret, but I did go and read the very last section. I figured I should always at least find out the last thing he had to say there. And I was uh, struck by the fact that he was uh, pointing out this digression that happened after Aristotle. Uh, and also, uh, he, he revisited and emphasized again the idea of uncoveredness versus, uh, I'm not sure, but Correct. a contrast there. Anyway, I like I like very much to have that brought out. Um, just one amusing touchstone. But we mentioned, uh, I think um, uh, Craig mentioned uh, the word reality in passing at some point. It seems to me that uh, Popper made a comment that just amused me because I mean because I think it's correct. But it said, um, you know, you, you might know what his, his general claims, but the point is that falsification is the moment in which uh, a theory actually touches reality. 
uh, and you know, according to Popper, theory can can still be correct, but never having been demonstrated or proven, uh, you sort of feel like or know that it is. But then, uh, but if it touches reality and it's falsified, uh, you you actually touch reality. And I thought that was amusing because we're talking about reality here, aren't we? Sounds great. We're also talking about the possibility of false opinions and uh, that, that that an opinion can be false. Um, uh, might be seen as a judgment of it, but from Heidegger, not Heidegger's, from Popper's point of view, uh, it's a merit in something that it's possible for it to be false. <laughs> um, uh, but when and, it is and, false, and, it's such a reality. That's all he's the other, claiming. Yeah, well, the, the, the other place, though, where, where this gets at the, um, uh, the this essential stuff in the reading, maybe parts of what you didn't do, is this uh, um, essential forking notion that you get in, that Heidegger explains as the sort of the structure of how opinion works, that it's got an element of it which is relating to experience and an element of it which is relating to this making present, this um, uh, dianetic or um, thought-like realm. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the fact that there are both of those, the fact that there's a, a, a complex structure that involves both those things is what makes possible, um, is the basis of the inner possibility of something like uh, 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 fal a falseness in an opinion. Um, that it's not, it's uh, what it aims at or intends can 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 miss, um, and we'll talk about the nature of that um, when we get there. But this there there is an element of what Popper is doing when he's contrasting uh, a theory and an observation, which is similar to the contrast here between um, uh, the Dianetic and the uh, aesthetic or the experiential. Um, uh, so they're definitely. Uh, Modern epistemology is definitely still playing in those registers, if I can put it that way. Um, but uh, Plato's particular opinion in that discussion, it's also worth bringing out. I mean, to some degree, he's the guy who gave us that dichotomy, who gave us that, that, that distinction. Um, and uh, some people like Nietzsche criticize him for it because it's making the distinction between the uh, the true world and the apparent world, and that's a denigration of the apparent world in favor of the true world, which isn't actually true or there. Um, so uh, 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 it's a devaluation of the apparent world to contrast it with the true world, um, uh, whereas all of which, when all of the things you can know about the true world are apparent, something like that is what we need to put the, the criticism. Uh, that's not uh, Plato's position, it's not Heidegger's position here, but I'm just I'm just pointing out to you that it's, it's the same um, that same problematic is is um, definitely at stake here in the modern philosophy. I think some of that was also in play back then. I think a lot of the things that you get in the typical um, uh, Nietzsche position on that are similar to the uh, positions of Protagoreans we got in the first half of this style of the Theatetus dialogue. But uh, so there there definitely are correspondences to the other things other things here. Uh, reading and thinking about. I think we want to understand where Plato comes down on them and where Heide how Heidegger interprets Plato on them um, uh, first, have that solid, and then we can relate it to what it might say uh, as similarities or differences from a Popper or a Nietzsche or anyone else. It helps to have the a compact sense of, a uh, graspable sense of what Plato is saying and what Heidegger is saying, Plato is saying. Um, but, uh, We'll get to that as we as we go through the second part. Uh, you're you're not wrong though to to see some of these connections out to other issues of modern philosophy. Let's put it that way. Um, Craig, you want to go next? Okay, <clears throat> I did slog through the reading. It uh, it was difficult reading, but when I got to the end, it was highly rewarding because it was the answer I was leaning towards. Uh, and uh, and I've done enough reading on the 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 you know, hidden middle and a few other things like that to see the connections to there. And it was the answer that I was seeing he was leading towards. He uh, had to take a while to get there, but I think he was trying to be extremely cautious in getting us there, uh, aside from a few uh, snips about Sleermacher uh, that he <laughs> kept sticking in. Um, yes. but, but yeah, I, I got to a lot of places and, uh, and it, it hit me. Uh, as I finished it up and I started thinking about the the sense in which there is there is that ambiguity and that that mixture of the two, and I realized uh, that the Greeks didn't only give us 
the, the reason, rational thought, they gave us theater and they gave us the sense of what comes out in theater and uh, and even the sense of tragedy, which makes me want to go back and re reread Nietzsche again to see where he came up on that, because there is a very definite element of connectedness there to the to the ambiguities and the situations that are presented in Greek theater. So, so I thought that was kind of a fascinating trip to take. Um, I tend to agree with some of the other comments that were coming up. You know, I'm still slogging my way through patterns of discovery, which deals with seeing as and seeing that and the interpretive nature of facts that is always essential. So I tend to agree with that that element there. But I think Heidegger put a foundation on it that was kind of critically important. So when you're saying the foundation, are you talking about this this forking business of the uh, realm of retention and the realm of uh, perception or some of that and and the the final kind of final answer on the essence of truth that it contains both uh, was uh, uh, was um, a, a good one for me to 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 come to grips with. I, I felt that was that was right in line with a lot of what I've been trying to discover and and see. So so uh, you know I, I felt like at the end the long slog was worth it. Uh, there were a few times I wanted to throw the book at the wall and say, <laughs> "All right, just just get on with it," you know. But uh, but it was worth it. So okay, uh, I want to mention just that you, you brought up the. Um... Uh, the theater aspect. Uh, the one way to think about some of this is when you get to the doxa structure, as he explicates it. You're also you're you're looking at seeming, what it means for something to seem, um, and uh, something seeming is both revealing something and concealing something, uh, and that's there in the notion of theater. Um, it's there in the notion of drama, um, as well as being there in the notion of doxa. Um, one of the theses of this book is that Plato is well aware of this. And the reason he writes dialogues is because he wants the drama to be the outermost context. He doesn't write logic textbooks. He doesn't write things which are Hegelian, uh, uh, reams of Hegelian logic like the Parmenides, uh, even if he uh, has some sense of pure dialectic as one of the modes of access to truth. He doesn't write uh, long uh, spinning things of dialectic. He writes dialogues, he writes plays. And uh, in that way, he, he lets uh, a dramatic context be outermost um, uh, in which um, uh, truth and opinion seem, and he's always ascending from opinions. Um, and this guy makes, uh, Schindler, um, makes the case that, that there's nothing accidental about that. It's essential to Schindler's, uh, what Schindler believes is Plato's own understanding of the, the nature of truth. Yeah, that so, I, so I got it. So I can start digging into that. Whether we yeah. go go to that one next, but but Great. I felt like that that really brought a broad, broader picture of, as you said, where the dialogues fit into to the entire Greek uh, milieu in in, in many respects. Yes. That which it was well, many people have pointed out that Plato is always denigrating poetry, and then he's writing it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's the ambiguity again. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, so uh, good from Craig, uh, Pete. Uh, so am I on? Yeah. Uh, so I, I read it through to the end for the last session. Uh, so this time I went and reread it. Uh, this time for an eye for where does Heidegger claim uh, the Plato did what he did? Uh, you know, the branching of metaphysics off. Uh, and so that that's basically it and my i'm reminded i think i might have mentioned this before that it, it if you can kind of follow it along as he's um uh, you know describing whatever subject is on but to remember the argument all the way through from uh you know starting from oh uh knowledge is perception and then breaking that down and then this has four parts and then you, you read it and you go yeah it makes sense but i can't remember all the entire path he's gone down uh to get to any specific spot uh but you know when i'm reading the text i sort of you know uh a bunch of it i i get what he's saying and other parts i don't which is you know, what, what I need to learn next. So that's it. Great. 
fair. I, I am going to ask you uh, if you found it. Um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it, I'm sure. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. I, I, I'm just going to draw everyone's attention quickly. I'm not, I'm not going to anticipate, I swear, uh, to page 252, the beginning of uh, section uh, 46. This is three pages from the end of our reading and the book. The first thing is, but the decisive step in our interpretation of Plato's elucidation of the pseudos is still outstanding. I just, okay. Um, so just signpost, put a pin in that. 252 pages, the decisive step is still outstanding. Um, so he's gonna make a decisive step a little mm -hmm. bit later than that, apparently. Um, we'll come back to it. Dan. Uh, hi. Um... Uh, I, as I mentioned before, I read this book like a few months ago and I didn't return to it these days, but I'm trying to follow along with you guys. And uh, I think again, like to me, like here is the, the essence of true. And I, the book that I mentioned last time, it was kind of the, the basic questions is like the, the true of essence, like Heidegger is turning around and looking the other way, like what's there, the, the, the essence. And yeah, I found that very interesting and how, what the implications of those are, but that's me following kind of Heidegger around. And uh, so probably for, from the other book, as I mentioned last time, I think Heidegger there is saying like, um, it happened here, like the correctness, the truth of correctness, it happened here with, with Plato and Aristotle, especially with Aristotle, but they, he said that they, they always have used to have Aletheia in view. And that was okay as long as you do that. Once you, you lost that, you, this, this kind of, of true is groundless and everything is falling apart or not falling apart, but going the way it did. So I, I found that kind of very interesting also that it's like, he's, he's not later, he's not going to accuse Plato or Aristotle, or Aristotle but he's going to say they, they did it the, the, the right way because Aletea was there. But for us today, when Aletea is not there, this, this no longer makes sense. And I think that's the point that it was important, is important for me. And that's yeah, it for and me. I, and, and I agree with that assessment. I think that that's a fairer assessment than the headline we got at the beginning of the book, so to speak. Um, uh, but that also means that the falling away is happening somewhat later, right? Um, it's... Uh, people reading Aristotle thinking that because Aristotle figured out this problem that by learning and being able to recite Aristotle, they no longer have to face the problem. That's closer to where the falling away happens than even an Aristotle formulating what he formulates as answers to puzzles posed by uh, Plato, let alone Plato posing the puzzles and all their puzzleness and all their openness to the experience, right? Um, and for me, that means that the, uh, the richness that is there in Plato and Aristotle is still fully there and uh, we can go back to it. Um, if someone thinks that all of these questions were settled when Aristotle uh, uh, put together a solution to the puzzles and, and uh, since then it has gone away and we don't need to worry about it, then uh, uh, I would agree that that is a falling away. So something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's what Plato or Aristotle were doing. And I agree with you that some some of Heidegger's uh, later stuff points in that direction is more nuanced than this point. I think he's very fair when he's doing the textual analysis of Plato and Aristotle themselves about the degree of, of dedication to truth that they themselves possess. But to me, that makes all the more striking the, the, the headline sweeping claims. And it makes me want to understand where Heidegger is getting them from, why he thinks them, why he uh, thinks that the structure that is implicated in those failings is not something like modernity or positivism or uh, uh, modern philosophy uh, or even maybe um, thoughtlessness in general or some, uh, something like that, but is instead metaphysics since Plato or Platonism. Um, so anyway, that that we, we'll 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 get to that when we get to that. But uh, I understand what you're saying. I think it's a it's a, it's it's fair to. Uh, Heidegger's own position, um, and you read all of it. Um, there's still there's still a contrast with the headline, and the headline is what a lot of people get. Um, and I, I think it's very common to um, take the theses as proven because 
Um, Heidegger was a very smart guy. He clearly was able to read these people. He read them in, in, in great detail. He taught all lecture courses on them, and he made these claims about them. So they must be substantiated by what's in the lecture courses. This is not always the case. <laughs> Uh, it's the same kind of falling away from contact to truth to think that must always be the case because you have received that opinion as is what he is decrying, right? If you're if you're directly confronting the phenomena themselves and the, and the, and the thoughts that the Plato's and Aristotle's are struggling with, and you can see them facing uh, uh, truth and uncoveredness themselves, engaging in philosophy seriously, it means that one has to engage with them seriously as, as well. <clears throat> and that means that doxology is not philosophy one thing um but uh anyway this is well we're getting into not even the exposition but the conclusions <laughs> but as usual uh this, these are good issues to raise and i i do uh think that the the suggestion to read basic questions of philosophy at some point in the future is a good one um that i want to go i i want to do to me the ma main question is is it immediately next or uh, is it after some other things uh, my inclination is to have it be after some other things just to show what's at stake um, to show what what uh, Heidegger conceives the stakes to be in this question of is metaphysics over on the one hand and is the uh, uh, is is uh, the history of Western philosophy fundamentally nihilism or something like that? Um, okay, uh, Dan, any you want to push back on any of that or have any other comments or should I go on to Jeff? I'm just giving you a chance to respond if you want it. Did we lose Dan? Is he having problems with his audio? Uh, yeah, a little bit of problem. No, no, I, I'm fine with what you said and I, I agree with you. I think he's... <laughs> I think he cut out there. You think he's something. Well, we're waiting. What was the Plato book that you were um, oh, sorry. This is uh, D.C. Schindler. It's an, it's an, it's it's called Cretato's Complete, which the title is a play on 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 Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, right? So Plato's Critique of Impure Reason, um, and uh, uh, it's kind of an interpretation of the Republic. It's mostly an interpretation of the Republic, but there's some other things going on in it. But fundamentally, he's dealing with the Republic as a text and a Plato's philosophy in general. Um, uh, the subtitle is on goodness and truth in the republic um and uh I, I am interested in getting to it even reading the republic together for that matter um uh he, he makes the case that the three metaphors in the middle of the uh divided line the idea of the good and and the the cave are form the peak of the republic but um you can come back to all of that um so uh jeff says go ahead and skip me because if you didn't do the reading yet so that's fine we've got our first reactions um so um, I want to give people a chance to um, raise the questions and subjects that they want to get into. I think that some of them we have uh, already touched on, um, but are there other things in the reading itself that you want to make sure um, we touch on? I go over in some detail, et cetera. Um, uh, Carlos, I know you often have questions. Uh, so um, if you've got any prepared, what is he saying here kind of questions, um, that might be a, a useful thing before we get going on the well, it's later in the reading. Uh, he has an exposition of logos, and I took advantage of that to attempt to clear up my perception of logos, which seems to be dependent on what you read. Uh -huh. If we have a chance, perhaps you can. Well, definitely. So it's the, the, the meaning, meaning of the word logos. I mean, we should talk about okay. a meaning of uh, um, doxa and the meaning of logos, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to do it now. We can do it later. That's just one. I get it. No, it's a good, it's a fine one to read uh, to raise rather. I mean, uh, uh, the question of logos. One other thing, uh, there there's part part of the sort of if I can put it this way, the head, headline idea about truth is correctness is that it's going to locate um, the essence of truth in the statement, um, and there's an element of that which is you know is uh, is thought or reasoning reducible to statements, and some of that is has to do with like uh, how much of this is is linguistic if I can put it that way. And there's there is a section here where he he um, first of all there's a section in the Theaetetus where Socrates explains to Theaetetus what he Socrates thinks um, thinking is the word the word he's being translated as thinking there is is, is dianoan right um, what is dianoan like and he says is is it uh, 
is it for you like it is for me that it's like an interior dialogue that the mm -hmm. soul that the soul has with itself where it poses questions to itself and judges uh and judges about it and uh socrates says that uh, it's a uh, uh, he's saying it to you as someone who doesn't know, but this is how it seems to me. There's an interesting uh, part of the testimony there. Mm -hmm. um, and but uh, Theotetus agrees. So this notion, this is the closest you get in the Theotetus to the notion that um, uh, thinking is something like it, it, an interior dialogue that uses words that includes judgments of what is and what is not. Um, and uh, Heidegger does uh, talk about that here, and he, he, um, he, he, but he mentions it as um, um, language being involved in the connection to being, and he is not critical of it at all. He's not criticizing that aspect of what Plato is saying at all. Um, he doesn't see in that any reduction of um, uh, thought to uh, linguistic philosophy in some reductive sense. Instead, he sees it as um, Yes, there's this there's this silent reasoning that uses words in which um, the soul judges about being a non-being, something like that. And there he's being expository about what uh, Socrates is saying in the Theotetus, and um, I think he's accurately describing what uh, what Plato is saying there. Um, and it is noteworthy that there's no criticism in it. He's not saying, and this is where philosophy goes off the rails and becomes entirely linguistic hair splitting and logic chopping, and it should never have done this. It should have, you know, been a silent seeing of the of the of the of the of the, of the ideal forms themselves, right? If anyone would make that comment, it might be Plato in the other direction, right? But the the silent dialogue the soul has with itself is something that Socrates puts forward in the Theaetetus as something about the nature of, of uh, thinking or reasoning. Um, that uh, Heidegger points out, remarks on, doesn't object to. Is this all that's going on in Logos? No. Lo Logos has some other meanings, and it comes up in two other main places in the dialogue. One of them is brought out a lot by uh, Joe Sachs, our translator of the uh, edition that Pete recommended. There's lots of places where gathering together is, uh, uh, the, the gathering together notion is, is, is used throughout the dialogue. Um, and that's one of the primitive sensitives of 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 the of logos and legan, um, legan yeah. um, which is to which is to gather together to bind right. Um, so the, the, the gathering together aspect. Um, the other place where it comes up heavily in the dialogue is towards the end uh, when we're talking about it's not just right opinion but it's right opinion with an account. The with an account is with a logos. It's with uh, an account or a speech or a reason. Um, uh, the uh, yeah. The back of the cereal box version of that is we, you know, the, the people say that the Theotetus uh, comes out on the side that um, knowledge is justified true belief, and the justified part is that it has an account. Of course, it doesn't come out on that at all. It comes out in Aporia, and we don't know. But <laughs> leave, leaving aside that, the, the, the justified part or the uh, uh, something has to be added to right opinion in order for it to be knowledge as being an account is here maintained by Theotetus and then shot down by Socrates, but it's maintained by Theotetus. Um, and the account that has to be added to it is a logos, a speech. I can give a speech as to why, I can give a reason as to why. So speech, reason, gathering, account, all of these things are um, kind of in the same word. If you go back to someone like Heraclitus, it also has the connotation of order um, uh, and order in things. A speech it, or reason or order and things. Go ahead, Carlos. A question. Does it re at some point in the reading? I remember coming across some place, and I wrote a question, but not. I don't have it overtly here. It's probably written on the book itself, where it seemed to indicate that that, uh, that uh, thinking requires language. In other words, you can't affect. You cannot affect the logos, if that's what it involves without having language. So, so the play, the play that I, I did mention this, this is, this is the thing I was talking about just before where, where um, Socrates says that it's something that um, Dianoan, uh, not just, he's not trying to describe uh, knowledge, but well, sorry, knowledge or even opinion, but he says Dianoan, this, this th thinking or reasoning is something like an internal dialogue that the soul has with itself that uses words and that judges. Um, 
and then after the ATS agrees, they, um, uh, they, they go they, they go forward on the on the basis of agreeing to that. Um, and uh, Heidegger points out that this is a it is a it is a reasoning, but it can be silent. It can be without words. And Socrates says it doesn't have to be for anybody else. Um, it's for oneself. But this this notion that there's something about reasoning which is um, uh, using words is propounded by Socrates, agreed by Theotetus, and Heidegger thinks it's natural. Um, he even says, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's no accident that this is, you know, uh, uh, th this is said here. Um, now, uh, what else is going on? Uh, there, there's other things we can get to about um, the degree to which that that logos is uh, reliable, or something like that. Is the right word? Um, there's a caricature often given of uh, Platonic reasoning that would think that the the realm of pure reasoning, the realm of knowing, would be uh, uh, pure and perfect and without error. And it's only when you deal with things of perception that you that error would come into things, because that's when you touch the realm of uh, uh, appearance, where things are you know uh, uncertain. But that's not at all what happens here. Socrates denies that explicitly. In fact, the reason that we go from the simile of the wax, the simile of the Avery, is because after they've agreed in the whole simile of the wax on this whole um, difference between perception and um, uh, knowledge, or between perception and um, something like the di Dianetic, the ex experience of uh, what Heidegger is calling the, 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 the farther extension of making present, uh, something like that, which just goes beyond the experience. Um, the difference between those is not the only cause of um, incorrect opinion, of false opinion, according to uh, Socrates, because his proof, drum roll, people make mistakes in mathematics. <clears throat> they, have no, they have no connection to an experienced thing when it's mm -hmm. pure reasoning. Reasoning purely alone with itself and only dealing with the things that is recalled still makes errors. So the inner possibility of error in opinion cannot rest solely on the fact that it sometimes has contact with a, 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 an area of perception that is um, distinct from the area of internal reasoning. Because even in internal reasoning, we err. Um, and uh, uh, he's obviously making this point to Theotetus, the mathematician. Right, uh, who knows full well that there are you know stark differences in mathematical reasoning ability, uh, and also that people make even people with very high mathematical reasoning ability uh, make mistakes, and this leads to the whole discussion in the Avery model about the difference between um, uh, knowing something in some uh, uh, broad sense of you knew it once, and having it immediately present right, right now. Um, so. Uh, uh, Theotetus knows arithmetic, which in some sense means he knows all the numbers, but he can still make a mistake in a, in a, in a math problem if the numbers are big enough, um, uh, because you know uh, Homer nods, so to speak. And there's a difference between knowing the whole thing in the sense of past familiarity with it, having learned it once, and having it immediately present at the front of your attention, right? Um, so, and it's noteworthy to me that Heidegger nowhere talks about the the, the, just the the move from the wax simile to the Avery simile. He mentions both of them, but it's quite clear to me that at the end of this book, he is speeding up because he's running out of time at the end of his lecture. I mean, his lecture course, right? He, he's running out of time to get through all of it. He hasn't gotten all the way through the Theotetus and he's racing to get in all the things he needs to get in. And the result is, he goes from the wax simile to the Avery simile without a single word about why the transition between them occurred. But the reason that transition occurred in, in the dialogue is because Socrates doesn't agree that the only cause of error is the difference between the register of perception and the register of thinking. That is the thesis of the section on the, on the wax. The section on the wax is about an er how an error can arise between the register of perception and the register of thinking. And Heidegger explains that very well. And his forking phenomenological model is exactly right about explaining how that happens. But that's not the end of the Theotetus. 
it is immediately criticized by Socrates along the, uh, because it seems to predict, it makes the phenomenal prediction that if error only happens when the realm of thought and the realm of perception have to be brought into correspondence with one another, if there were no realm of perception involved, there would be, wouldn't be error, but there is. Error occurs phenomenally, even when we're entirely in the realm of thinking. And that means that the inner possibility of error has to be broader than only dealing with the difference between the registry of perception and the registry of thinking. And this is central to the claim that Heidegger is making here. And he just doesn't talk about it. He just jumps immediately from the, from the wax to the, to, to, to the Avery. Um, and then when he's discussing the Avery thing after he's done a decent job of, of exposition on it, he, he just says, why are these things here? And it's very fast. He doesn't really have a, uh, a convincing explanation of why the Avery model is there. And he certainly doesn't bring out the fact that, that um, Socrates has emphasized that error occurs in the purely noetic realm. Craig, question. I just wanted to say you hit exactly the topic I was going to try to bring up. He, you know, he does a great job of explaining those two uh, similes and then went, falls off a cliff. And uh, so that, so I appreciate this discussion because that's exactly yeah. what I wanted to try to hear because I thought there was so much more in those two similes and finally on having some understanding of why they got shoved into the middle of the dialogue that uh, that didn't get done. And uh, I'm, I'm just uh, happy to hear my question already getting answered without even having to bring it up. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yes. I mean, and and uh, the transition between them, I mean, it's 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 very important because there, there's definitely a, a caricature version of Platonism that doesn't see, that wouldn't expect Socrates to have that objection, right? Um, but Socrates is, and Plato are in no way committed to the proposition that uh, the, the dionetic sphere, if kept pristine from contact of the perceptibles, will be a, a, a realm of infallibility, nothing like it. Um, now, I think that despite that, one can still save the, the forking notion that you get in Heidegger, not just as a description of the, uh, of the possible errors between perception and uh, the noetic, but more broadly, um, if you if if in place of the perception you put the uh, subject of attention, you can have the same tension between what is retained and what is the subject of the uh, center of the attention, as you can have between what is retained and the subject of perception. Um, so I think that the phenomenological work that Heidegger is doing there is sound and is can and and you know it can be broadened, but it's not just about the. The perceptible. I think he's also sound there in showing that the the realm of the noetic is broader than the realm of the perceptible. I think that that's both sound phenomenology, it's sound exposition of Plato, and I think Plato agrees with it. I don't think it's a disagreement with Plato there. I think it's an agreement with Plato there. Um, okay, there are still important questions about what kinds of error arise and when and how that we have to get to. Sorry, Dan, question. Can I say comment? something? Yeah. Yes, please. please. I it just just happened i read this morning like i think it's the the, the word of arc article and there heidegger of course he gets even more abstract and away from this point but i i, I thought it's funny and I, I want to mention it so basically he's saying that error occurs to him like at this point in two ways so one he said it's the beings are not fully unconcealed so that's one source and said that the second source is like beings stand in front of each other, like we take one being for another. And to him, that's pretty much how he, 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 like error occurs. And it said pretty much we cannot distinguish between the two. So he no longer talks about sense or reason or anything like that. He gets even more abstract than this and goes back to the to the roots of his theory. So it's again, it's beings are not fully unconcealed and being stand in front of each other and we take one for another and it says that's pretty much the, the the root source of all error that's i know it's a little bit out of context but i wanted to mention it yeah and and uh so i don't know if it's sort of root source of all error in in the um there's another shorter uh essay on uh, essence of truth where he talks about uh uh error and errancy um uh, i'm thinking the one in basic writings um and there error as errancy is kind of a broader field. There is definitely this notion of what um, stands in front uh, conceals. 
The notion that what stands in front both reveals and conceals, by the way, is, is the whole structure of seeming. Um, and seeming is idea. I, I, idea. Um, it, it cannot be a coincidence that Plato is the philosopher of idea and the philosopher of the, 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 the problematic nature of, of seeming as what both reveals and conceals. Um, uh, I, I, my point is that I think that that notion in Heidegger is much less unplatonic than he thinks it is. Um, and that's part of the case that uh, Schindler makes in his book, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the idea and the image, both revealing and concealing, is uh, is central to Plato. Um, I, I want to get to the mo modes of error, because there's, there's a fundamental thing going on here. And I realize I'm jumping ahead for a second. Um, I was pointing out to Pete that uh, Heidegger himself says that the critical step has not yet been, staken, been taken on page 252. And what that means is that in his own assessment, he has not yet shown the fundamental thing about um, uh, is Plato going off the rails in the, in the, in the direction of truth, uh, taking uh, the path away from uh, aletheia and uncoveredness and towards uh, something else like, like correctness. Um, he says that that decisive step has not been taken. And then on 252, when he tries to say that that ha is taken, he there's like 11 lines of actual exposition. And then there's the line, it is a missing of the mark, a failure of the intended predicate. Um, this is how he understands mistaking. And the thing which is striking there is that he throws in this word predicate and italicizes it. And you can search the rest of the book and all the Theotetus and never find the word predicate. There is no doctrine of predication as the nature of truth in the Theotetus. Um, there is one in Aristotle. And if you look a little bit later, the actual citation at the end of the section is to Aristotle's metaphysics, not to Plato, right? Um, right, and, and predicate is a, is a Latin word. Sure, but but uh, what, what is actually going on, what is actually going on here is there there, there is a description of missing the mark uh, in, in the Theotetus specifically in the in the part where they're talking about uh, this is actually before the wax is even brought in the 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 possibility or impossibility the possibility or impossibility of um, false opinion and Socrates is maintaining that uh, the paradoxical position that false opinion is impossible which by the way is a paradigm of false opinion if anyone likes Cretan paradoxes um, and there's no way that Plato didn't notice that <laughs> um, but uh, so he's he's defending that position, and by the way, there's definitely throwbacks of that to the whole discussion with, about Protagoras, because the whole first half of the of the dialogue, even before we got to the perception part, because um, uh, that every uh, the, the man is the measure of relativist position that everyone uh, uh, is is right about the truth as it appears to them, uh, position that uh, uh, Socrates is presenting as as the Protagorean position on the question also believes that there's no such thing as false opinion, right? And he even explicitly maintained that as a Protagorean thesis. So you have to notice in the second half of the dialogue, Socrates is arguing for position of Protagoras, right? He's, he's still steel manning Protagoras, right? So uh, that thesis that there's no possibility of, of, of false opinion is not just coming in from left field, it's the Protagorean thesis being maintained and attacked, right? And it's difficulties un un understood. Okay, but what's the point there? The, the missing the mark involved in the example he gives is one in which uh, you have two, two individual people, uh, a Theotetus and a Socrates, one of whom is mistaken for the other, right? Uh, when they are, when, when one of them is, is being perceived and both of them are being remembered, right? So both of them are in, re in retention and both of them are in retention as stub snubbed snub-nosed and googly-eyed, right? Um, and then a, a person is coming from far off who appears to be snub-nosed and googly-eyed, and the person seeing them uh, takes it to be uh, Socrates when in fact it's Theotetus. Is this an error in the predicate, I ask you? So they share the predicate, so all the predicates that are mentioned, snub-nosed and googly-eyed, right? They don't mention young and old, which might distinguish them, right? 
but would still, as Socrates points out, lump them in with lots of other people, right? The, 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 the outward look of snub nose and googly eye that is being used to identify the person is exactly what they share. It's the source of the seeming that can create the illusion that can create the misidentification. It's exactly the predicates in which they agree. But because two subjects have the same predicates, it is easy to mistake one of those subjects for the other because the predicates are used as their marks. That's the actual kind of error that is under discussion, which is precisely not an error in the predicate. An error in the predicate would be you'd think that someone was snub nose when in fact he had a Roman nose, right? This is not an error of the predicate. Or you think that the person coming towards you is young and in fact he's old Socrates, right? That would be an error in the predicate. The error here is in which individual is being identified with that net of predicates. The net of predicates is thrown over different actual possible uh, individual particulars in the world, and it's too coarse to catch only one of them. It hits all of them class-like, and precisely because it hits all of them class-like, it is possible to misidentify, but the mistake is an identification, and identification is not an error in the predicate. It's an error in the subject. It's describing the, the, uh, uh, a different individual that shares those characteristics to it. So the, the kind of reasoning that, uh, that the person making this error uh, uh, is in, engaged in is, you know, Socrates is snub-nosed and googly-eyed. This man coming towards me is snub-nosed and googly-eyed. Therefore, this man may be Socrates. And as a matter of can be, maybe that is correct reasoning. It rules out a lot of other people in the world, but it's only a can be you can deduce from that. That he is, Socrates, is exactly the jumping to the conclusion by using the outward look as the sign of the thing that we always do, but that it's, of course, the source of an empirical error, precisely not about predicates, but about subjects. Carlos. Excuse me. Is it possible? Well, it's possible, but is it legitimate to claim that the predicate is the error because it's incomplete? You could, the, the, the section toward the end, we get to the question of the completeness of predicates, right? We get to the uh, completeness of descriptions. As soon as we bring in an account, the question of right opinion with an account, we'll get to why we do that in a second. But in the, in the dialogue, when we get to right opinion needing an account, um, they, they ask how much of an account, how, what, what counts as an account? Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, uh, understands the, of an account that Socrates proposes is, a description sufficiently detailed to distinguish that thing from every everything else that exists, right? Um, and this was a this was a notion of uh, uh, of essence that was you know uh, elaborated in the in, in the in the medieval period, in the scholastic period. This was a kind of the Dun Scotus version of what an essence is: is a a a, a set of cross cutting distinctions. You know, each of them is only a distinction, and each of them is only a class. But together, all those classes get down to the point where there's actually only one individual in the world that satisfies them, right? Um, and then he has disagreements. He, Duns Scottus, will have disagreements with people like Aquinas over whether or not that's sufficient to actually be the particular. Um, but that harks back to this, uh, to the idea of an account in the last parts of Theotetus. Socrates doesn't shoots down this notion for two reasons. The first is that um, the First is the way that it's the final operator of the whole dialogue. We'll, we'll come back to that. But the second is that all of those all of those accounts always hit, uh, uh, even if they empirically hit one thing, they always in principle hit more than one thing, right? The what do I mean by that? Cross cutting classes as just classes are still classes, right? They're not individuals. the 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 individual description, right, is saying. Uh, this guy here, right? And that's why in the in the in the medievals they brought in you know things like a thisness, right? Uh, and, and these these other things added on when they were trying to get at the notion of a, a thisness or or an existence as something to be added on to the formula of essences, because just having a a, a set of essential distinctions that are fine enough to you think get only this person leaves open all the other possible people who are who, who share all all of those things, and if they if there isn't a, a an empirical person or an empirical, per, per, empirical person nearby who shares them all, that doesn't mean there couldn't be because it's just a set of classes. And sets of classes are always universal, not, a, not an individual. There's a numerical difference between being a member of, of, of any number of sets and being an individual. 
That's the point. So, and, and, and Socrates himself brings this out, right? Uh, he, he's, he's not stumping for, if I just give you enough distinctions, then I've caught you. The place where the idea that you can just use uh, cross-cutting distinctions to, uh, to, to classify things is the sophist. It's the dialogue right after this one. And it leads to definitions of man as the featherless biped, famously, which is meant to be both humorous and an example of sophistry, not an example of science, right? There's always something about the choice of the sets of distinctions that you choose that eventually arrives at a class with only one, one individual in it, right? That has free play and arbitrariness in it, right? And that's not the same as essential reasoning to either Plato or even to Aristotle, right? Essential reasoning comes to what is necessary for this to be true, not an accidental set of cross-country distinctions that happens to arrive at a set of size one. Those are not the same procedure. The second reason that Socrates rejects the idea that the, uh, the formula of the, uh, uh, of the unique account is, this, is the thing which makes a true opinion knowledge is that it's the same as saying you have knowledge of the thing. And so you have a self-reference problem. You say, knowledge is true opinion with an account. What's an account? Knowledge. Right. So knowledge is true opinion with a knowledge. And so you get a circular problem that you define a knowledge in terms of itself. But that's the fine, which is the final apparia of the of, of the dialogue at which it ends. And they, you know, it says, it says this is comical. Um, but so there may be something to be said for having a something like an exhaustive account of something, but an exhaustive account of something down to its elements is not simply that thing. And the whole set of things which Heidegger doesn't go into at all here. In the last section of the Theotetus are all the uh, paradoxes of composition and can you know something by knowing all of its elements, uh, the arrangement being more than just the elemental spelling of the thing uh, done, and this is done on the element, on the um, model of language, how language works, and also on the model of uh, the wagon, right? The construction of the wagon, knowing how to construct a wagon, um, which is taken from Hesiod. Um, but th those examples in the last part of the Theotetus are all about this issue about whether or not just sets of, to come to this way, universal declarations of attributes of something are that thing. And nowhere is it maintained that they are in the Theotetus. Okay. So what is the nature, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because the, the, uh, the idea that truth is correctness is, 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 is pushing the possibility of error off into uh, errors in the predicate, missing the mark by uh, applying categories incorrectly, right? That is not what is being maintained in the Theotetus. It might be what's being maintained in, in Aristotle, often the metaphysics and the place that he's citing, right? It is not what is being maintained in the Theotetus. All of the errors in the Theotetus come from, you have a set of uh, characteristics which point to the same thing, but they, because they point to two things, you mistake one for the other, which is a, a misidentification. And this, this comes down to whether or not the classes that something uh, fulfills and it, it itself are the same thing and it's denied. Why does this matter? This matters because um, Heidegger very correctly talks about this whole structure of the forking of the intention. And he talks about the intention of, of the tower. We'll get to the, 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 the tower at the top of the mountain in the, in, in the black forest in, in, in a little bit, right? But his point of that is that the, the, the mind is, is intending its objects and the intended object of the man walking towards me is not anyone who is snub-nosed and googly-eyed. It's this man there, right? It has a thisness to it. And because this, the, the, the subject of the reasoning is not meant to be just a set of cross-cutting distinctions, it can miss. So just a set of cross-cutting distinctions might hit all googly-eyed and stub-nosed people. And if I was only trying to reason about all uh, uh, um, uh, snub-nosed uh, and googly-eyed people, maybe all of my theorems about them would go through, right? And it would be often just in the realm of pure reasoning. But as soon as I'm trying to actually identify the person coming towards me, it's not enough to identify them by a few characteristics. I'm trying to actually identify an individual with a thisness. And that's an existential predication, not a, an existential judgment, right? Not a, a predicate judgment. And 
if you like, that's where it's making contact with it, with reality. It's sticking its neck out in, in uh, to speak a uh, popper. It's willing to be wrong. It's not enough that I have said a, the person coming towards me is if I per, if all I said was the person coming towards me is uh, uh, snub nosed and googly eyed, I would avoid the possibility of error. But I wouldn't have stuck my neck out and said the person coming towards me is Socrates. I would avoid the possible error of it be actually being Theotetus but I also wouldn't have reached out to try to identify the actual individual coming towards me. That, by the way, is exactly what Descartes recommends that you do. He recommends you don't stick your neck out and that you only say the permanent person coming towards me is snub nose and googly eyed and thinks that that way, because you're only sticking with the characteristics that you saw subjectively verified that you can avoid error. You just rein in the truth claims until you're not making truth claims about existential statements. You're only making truth claims about predicate statements and only as they seem to you. And Descartes thinks in that way, you can avoid error. But Heidegger rightly criticized this as a, as a, as a subjectivist uh, uh, evasion of, of the responsibility of reason to actually make contact with reality. You're trying to actually know without that person coming towards you is, is Socrates or Theotetus. And even if only all you have is a guess that it's Theotetus, it's better to have a guess that it's Theotetus than to suspend judgment to avoid being wrong, right? Plato is saying we don't suspend judgment and, and we can be wrong. He's not saying we should suspend judgment, nothing like it. Now, where I agree with Heidegger is when he brings out all these things, he's right to say that this problematic is a place that let, let, let people like uh, um, uh, Descartes come to conclusions like that, that if we only didn't stick our necks out, we would uh, uh, avoid that, uh, that kind of error. Fine, but Plato, Socrates at least, is not advocating that we don't stick our necks out. He's advocating that we do stick our necks out. Okay, so reactions to any of that, questions about any of that? Yeah, so um, the, the question is, so, somebody's coming towards you and they're googly-eyed and snub-nosed, uh, and therefore, based on categorizations, you assume that person is Socrates. Uh, and, and, and so there, you're, you're using the logos and uh, predication uh, to come to a conclusion. Uh, and so, so I think the person I would appeal to here to explain this is Jane Austen. But Jane Austen wouldn't say that you know who somebody is from having heard about them and knowing uh, their properties, how to categorize them. You learn how somebody is by being introduced to them. So if you want to discover who somebody is, you don't recall everything you've heard about that person and their property. You discover them because they're introduced to you. And so the originary way of knowing a thing is because it's revealed to you, you discover it, you don't know what something is from the logos because you know about categories. And so you would know what a horse is by somebody saying there's a horse rather than knowing oh, a horse has four legs, kind of a longish snout, uh, sort of a tail that's like this, that the originary truth is from having it appear to you rather than through knowing uh, and categorizations. So I'm gonna partly agree with you. Uh, uh, the, and, and I think that that is where Heidegger would come out on the point, right? Um, but the, one of the points of the earlier discussion of the, um, uh, is is uh, is perception the basis of, is, is perception knowledge was that the uh, the originary truth that you have is not simply a percept, right? 
you're 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 reaching out beyond the percepts to the being of the thing and right, and, so. and those the the being of the thing and the judgments about the being and oneness etc of the thing are themselves conceptual in a sense now that's not to say that the uh um that they are reducible to a formula of concepts but it is to say you you as a as a as a person as a soul that has this capacity uh do have experience of those things which are not simply um uh how to put it they're not simply um uh aesthetics or a uh, perception in the in the narrow sense right they are perceptions in the noetic sense they're they're noetic and that that was something which heidegger agreed with in the first uh, in the first part and that socrates took himself to have established the the souls the soul reaches out to the to the to being oneness etc of 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 the things uh, that it is dealing with because it has a broader arena of experience of those things than just what the senses bring it right. and and that reaching out that, that mental act of reaching out is what heidegger is here calling the making present and that that making present is something like an intellectual intuition something like that that brings the which which brings something uh for possible reference, if I can put it, reference, if I can put it that way, independent of whether or not you've ever been there, right? You yeah. can know Socrates by having read all the Platonic dialogues and, and thought about them and understood him without ever having met the man Socrates. And you can know what Heidegger is talking about, about the watchtower on the top of a mountain in the Black Mountains, uh, sorry, in the Black Forest, without ever having been to the Black Forest. And that doesn't mean that when you hear him talking about it, you think that the reference, uh, the referent of what he's talking about is a set of words or a set of concepts about towers in, in, uh, locate, in geographical locations in Germany. The actual reference of what he's talking about is the actual tower on the mountain in Germany. And uh, we, we are capable of reaching out to that and acknowledging that without needing to stand in front of that tower right and i put it to you that this is something that uh plato and heidegger agree on vehemently i don't know if jane austen does but certainly um john locke doesn't right they they are both much more firmly in the intellectual intuition camp in the soul as a sensorium of being camp than uh uh, thinking that only what is uh, perceived with the senses in bodily presence is uh, is uh, is the the origin of knowledge and truth, something like that. The way in which things are uncovered to us is not by our eyes; it's by our minds, and that's why the being of that tower in Bavaria can be uncovered to me, even if I've never been to that place in Bavaria. Does that make sense? yeah uh but so but the, the the point that heidegger's i think trying to make is that in, in deciding whether it's theatetus or socrates uh heidegger is saying that uh the right way to make to know whether it's true or false whether the person coming towards me is socrates or not uh is, is based on uh figuring out oh is he stubbly uh stubbly nose and googly eye no what 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 they're what they're i think what heidegger and uh, Plato are both saying is that because you're trying to know whether or not it's actually Theotetus or Socrates, Socrates coming towards you, and that is what you're trying to reach out with your inner mind, and the, the actual subject of the intention of your judgment is the person coming towards me, and you're attempting to identify that person, because of that, it is possible to err in that identification. 
-hmm. And uh, everyone who thinks that the markers used to do the uh, identification are um, some error-free formula, or if we stuck to only judging about them, we could avoid the possibility of error by not making the existential predication, is missing the point because the whole point of the judgment is to reach out to the actual intended object of consciousness, which is the, the actual person coming towards me, and ascribe to them, uh, and ascribe which person that is. Now, Heidegger mentions at one point, he says, uh, this, this only happens when you, uh, when, when, when you don't have both of them there in perception, because then it's all over. And I deny this, right? He, he says at one point that if, uh, uh, when you talk about possible misunderstandings, if you uh, are familiar with Socrates, and you're familiar with Theotetus, and, and uh, only one of them is coming towards you, right? Then it can, it can remain ambiguous and unknown, but once they're both there in front of you, it's all over. Well, I mean, it depends. It depends on how, how, how much alike they look. I maintain that if they if they uh, look enough alike, or if your capabilities of perception are dimmed down enough, they can look exactly alike. But there would still be the possibility of errors because it would still be a difference between them. They would still be numerically distinct individuals, and their classes do not change that fact. The classes that they share do not change that fact. Even the inability to distinguish them when they're twenty feet away wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, 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 get rid of that fact. Maybe your eyesight is so poor that 20 feet away, it's as hard as it is for us at, uh, at half a mile. Or they could be professional Socrates and Theotetus impersonators. Impersonators, there, of course, yes, or clones or whatever. But the, the, the point is they're still, they're still uh, different individuals. And the, the, thing which, the thing to notice about what both uh, Heidegger and uh, Socrates are saying is that the possibility of error is there because we are actually jumping to the conclusion, we are actually trying to do the identification. We're not saying the man coming towards me is Snubdos and Google Guide. We're trying to say the man coming towards me is Socrates. That is the actual intention of our judgment. Right? Carlos, question? Just to be sure, if instead of uh, Socrates Theotetus, we had a non-material presentation, this whole argument would still apply. Well, the, uh, excellent question, and this is this is exactly why these uh, the part after the wax simile goes to the Avery simile, simile is because when they're having the wax discussion and most of Heidegger's discussion here, it 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 looks like uh, it looks like you could only make that error about a perceptible. You would only make that error about something you could be. But but Socrates says if that were the case, that were the only source of error, we'd never make mistakes in math, but we do. And he brings that up precisely to show that. This misidentification can happen entirely within the realm of Dian Dianoia, entirely, right? When there's no realm of a thesis involved. In other words, it doesn't have to be something in front of your nose that you're mistaking for something you remember. It can be something that you're trying to pay attention to and calculate about, and something you that, that, that you only have in your retention that are mismatched. And and of course that would apply to something that's Ineffable, because that just brings language in. Um, sure. Um, the uh, ineffable is a hard concept, um, uh, <laughs> especially because it's a, a, a concept that contradicts itself. Uh, it's saying it cannot be said, and then it's saying right. it. Um, but uh, 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 we, we can leave aside ineffable. The, the place where this came up in later scholastic philosophy, when they were, was the the, the there was a, uh, a big debate in the time of Aquinas about whether or not um, uh, things that were pure, uh, purely noetic uh, had to have, uh, ha there had to be only one of them or whether or not there could be more than one, right? And, and the, the, uh, the Latin Averroists were the tra tra tradition that believed that uh, all of these um, uh, idea-like things are just class concepts, wanted to say that without without individuating matter, they're the same thing. So if two things are completely abstract and they agree in their definitions, there's only one of them, right? And he was saying there's therefore, there cannot be two of something which are, uh, which are immaterial. And Aquinas maintained against them, no, they differ in their existence, not in their essence. You can have two numerically distinct things of exactly the same definition 
even if both are abstract and without matter. And this was a, a position that the uh, other people in the whole uh, medieval um, discussion of the universals didn't understand, right? It's, it's, it's one of the most distinctive things about that debate. I, I'm just bringing this in to, to, to point out that there's multiple positions on this. It's subtle and how you think about um, classes, instances, universals, and abstraction is implicated in it. Plato doesn't think of ideas in this sense as abstractions. The, the, the Aver Latin Averroists I'm telling you about did. They thought that because they're just abstractions, there, there's no way that one, uh, uh, if I can put it this way, one def purely set definition uh, uh, of something that doesn't differ in its definition, there can only be one of them, yeah. was their claim. Um, but that's because they believed that they were abstract. In some sense, they didn't think they were real. Um, but okay, uh, probably too far afield for this, but these questions do get implicated in this. And the thing that's triggering me here is the fact that Heidegger is, is calling the error of missing the mark that he sees Socrates describing in the section on the, uh, 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 the, the wax example as being an error predication. And this is how he gets to the notion that this is where Plato has introduced the idea that um, uh, Errors in predication and in uh, and in judgment and uh, these things only being judgments about language and in the mind, all of which are Aristotle, not here. This is where he gets that. And I, why why am I uh, harping on that so much? Because there's so little else supporting it. Um, I'm going to give uh, both Pete and Dan a chance to show me the other th tell me the other things that are supporting it. But I claim that the decisive step step in his interpretation of uh, the pseudos is still outstanding on 252. Um, I've read all the other parts. I agree, he's correct. He hasn't shown up before then. And the the, the mistaking of what what is encountered, all of that stuff, um, all the stuff on forking, by the way, is, a, is a, a phenomenological explanation of what Plato himself is describing. And I think it's expository. You can view some of that as, um, attempting to complete or clean up things which he thinks that Plato didn't understand as accurately as he could have, but they're not a disagreement with Plato. They might be an improvement on, 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 on exposition of that piece of it, um, but they're not disagreeing with what Plato was saying there, or what Socrates was saying there. And they, we've already mentioned the fact that he leaves out the math problem. Um, but this, uh, the holding, holding to Socrates, the passing by of Theotetus, like an archery mission of the mark where I hit Socrates instead of Theotetus, up until that point, I claim everything here has been expository. He said, I'm now going to give you the final proof, right? That this is what, uh, uh, what he did. He's only got two pages to do it. And everything up until then was expository. And he says, uh, does not who was made present in advance. That's agreed. It is a missing of the mark, agreed. A failure in the intended predicate. And that one italicized predicate at the end of the line is the sum total of the argument so far in favor of that thesis, in my opinion, in my claim. So when he says the missing mark is a failure of direction, he's going back to being expository of, of being incorrect. I, I agree with that, but it's the, 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 the mistake is of uh, the ascription of uh, identity, it, which is not predication. Uh, incorrect is the predicate means incorrect in the proposition. That's a tautology in, in, its, in itself, but it's not connected to the previous because a failure of addressing is not a failure of the predicate. Sorry, the subject is not the predicate. Um, and a failure in the in the in, in the subject is not a failure in the predicate. Okay, and then Plato grasps the essence of the pseudos and the uncorrectness of the logos or the proposition, not shown, simply not shown. That the the the, the there, yeah, not shown. Um, the the person who who claims that uncorrectness in the logos or in the proposition, um, is the is the source of pseudos is Aristotle. Uh, you might say that it's Aristotle trying to uh, untangle the, the 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 puzzles laid out in the Theotetus, but it's not in the Theotetus. Uh, in this way, the pseudo logos conceded the logos of the pseudos. The essence of untruth is now uncorrectus. The mistaking that loose back the character uh, of the logos, uh, the character of the proposition. Okay, everything else of that is a, is a deduction, and then he cites Aristotle. So I claim that the although the whole book was intended to maintain that thesis. All of the weight so far has been carried in several foreshadowings of I'm going to say this, 
the 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 section heading of calling this ontological failure shifting in uh, at the section heading of 46 that one italicized predicate at the end of the line which he, which came in flying in that left field and was motivated by nothing nowhere and the rest is either exposition tautology or aristotle there's no argument here in my opinion substantiating the claim that plato is the person who brings in truth as correctness as the truth of the proposition you won't find that in the Theotetus. I, there's lots of other ways I can point out that, that you won't find that in Theotetus because uh, the Theotetus doesn't even claim to give you the definition of knowledge. It doesn't even give, claim to give you the definition of pseudos. It does raise the inner possibility of error, but it sees the inner possibility of error as li lying even within reasoning itself, not just in the uh, particular kind of error that was talked about as this um, error of address that he has correctly uh, described, but that er even that error of address is not an error in the, in the predicate. So if this is all he's got to hang on, uh, to hang the, uh, the thesis, that it is Plato who invented the uh, truth as correctness mistake, if that's what it is, he has not shown it. I will pause for uh, reactions. So, so you, you would agree that Aristotle a generation later says uh, truth is the correctness of the proposition. Absolutely. And it is so a characteristically Aristotelian thesis. Right. And so the question is, where, where does Aristotle get it? He, he doesn't claim to have made it up. And Actually, he does. He claims to have figured it out as the, as the correct solution to a set of puzzles that uh, Plato and Socrates may have left for him, but that as puzzles were a tissue of misunderstanding and sophistry that he, Aristotle, is going to sort out and uh, apply common sense to and sort into an answer. And the and the truth is correctness theory of, of the proposition and, and the judgment and all of that that you get in Aristotle is accurately described as the, as the correspondence theory of truth at the start of this book. And it is meant to be the solution to all of those puzzles in uh, that come, come out of Plato. Plato is all puzzle. Right, Plato, so Plato is not on, one solution to those puzzles. Right. So, so we know that Plato wrote a lot of dialogues and wrote textbooks that were yep. the textbooks of the academy. Yes. And we know Aristotle wrote a bunch of dialogues and wrote a bunch of yes. textbooks. And the difference between the two is we have all of, we have Plato's dialogues. And we have Aristotle's textbooks. I put it here. There's a, big, have, there's a bigger, bigger difference than that. But, but and so presumably Aristotle went to the academy yes. and got all the textbooks. Yes. Uh, so far, you're arguing from absence about what you hope was the case. All right. And so, so you know, and so since we only have dialogues, uh, I'm sorry. The only in that statement doesn't work. So we don't have because Plato's because we name. because we actually have dialogues. Now continue. Because we have dialogues and we have dialogues between Socrates and Theotetus and other uh, actors, we don't actually have Plato's textbooks. We just know what Plato said about. Socrates. We, we, we know that Plato said that will, there will never be any uh, 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 writings of Plato, but only of a Socrates made young and beautiful in the seventh letter. Uh, but but he, he was lecturing to Aristotle on. Ab absolutely. And, absolutely. And, and, again, 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 you're, 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 you're not making your case, Pete. The, 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 right, right. I'm not going to say here, the, the claim. The claim here, the claim here, let's be clear. The claim here is that because Plato veered away from a, a direct connection to truth as Aletheia in favor of truth as uh, uh, untruth, as a uh, false opinion, as incorrectness, as uh, a, a, a inaccurate predication and a failure in the predicate, because he did that, Western civilization has been nihilism in the Nietzschean sense since Plato. And giant consequences, let me finish. Giant consequences are supposed to follow from this. I'm not going to buy it if your only argument for it is what you guess happened in the academy. You need some actual evidence for a claim like that, some actual evidence in reasoning, not 
it you think it might have happened that way well you know you, you go to a jury and you don't have perfect facts but you have context and okay. circumstantial. Let's evidence. let's 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 bring up jury. What? Why? Why? Uh, it, why does the need to have an account come in at the end of Diotetus? The need to have an account comes in because after he's gone through both the similes and he shot down both the similes, and those are not uh, no, not not good enough. Uh, uh, he comes back to Theotis and says, so what do you think uh, a knowledge is? And he says, it's, it's right opinion. And then he says, there's an entire profession which proves that right opinion is not knowledge. It's persuasion in the law courts, because what happens in the law courts is not knowledge, but opinion, right? This proof, and if they, if they judge rightly, it's right opinion. But there's no way the jury that has been merely persuaded to, to rule correctly has actual knowledge of the thing uh, that they learned in 15 minutes while, pers while his office was talking on a water clock. Right, so that's not sufficient. Right, it's not sufficient that you give me uh, a, a an opinion about how the uh, how how the West in metaphysics veered off its course in Plato, and your only evidence for it is something you think would work with a sophist in a law court. Not going to work. Where I'm at leisure, I I I have infinite time to consider these things. I'm not going to have to make the judgment on a water clock in 15 minutes. Right, so it needs an actual argument. Now, maybe that actual argument is often basic questions of philosophy, but that that, uh, that argument is not here. So, I, so what I think Heidegger is saying by missing the mark is uh, that Plato is saying that. Um, the uh, how, how we find out if somebody is Socrates or not uh, is by checking through the, the what we know about Socrates. Where I, I, I'm sorry, I can't find that. I, Plato I can't, is not saying that. Not only is Plato not saying that, Heidegger isn't even saying that Plato is saying that. Heidegger, Heide, when Heidegger is explaining Plato, Heidegger is saying Plato understands the 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 uh, the doctrine of uh, intentionality and what the actual object of the mind is that you would get in Husserl, that the uh, intended object of my judgment is the actual person talk, walking towards me and not a set of concepts. I'm not trying to talk about the representation of persons. I'm not trying to talk about memory of a person. I'm not trying to talk about a set of a set of concepts about the person. I'm trying to talk about the actual person talking walking towards me, and I make a judgment about that. And in that judgment, I have to bring together retained and percept. And the retained and percept can be in conflict. Plato is saying because the retained is only idea. It's exactly the fact that the idea net doesn't suffice to be the 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 the, the, the individual. That Plato is in, that Socrates is insisting is the reason it can miss. Now, the, the the philosopher ideas is telling you the ideas are not the whole thing. The ideas you retain in your memory are not the whole thing, and he's doing so because he agrees with the intentionality point that could be made straight out of Husserl. So, to me, those people, Husserl, Heidegger, Plato, Socrates, they're agreeing on how uh, on, on how the mind actually tries to reach out to judge of the, of, of the actual beings. They're not disagreeing about it. So you're not going to find a way to to to, uh, to 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 horn in there and say, "Oh, this is his clear mistake in the matter." It's not a mistake. The the place where he's actually explaining what 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 Socrates says, he doesn't even manage to an allege a mistake. So he's alleging that uh, Plato decides whether this person is Socrates or not is based primarily on correspondence. No. First that's, of all, Plato, that's for, what Heidegger's saying. No, he's not saying that. Find, find, find the page where he says correspondence. He doesn't say it. Oh, he doesn't. Okay. Well, that's what I, I didn't want to use the word predicate. It's not what he says. 
when he's talking about the four the incor incorrect addressing addressing you're, yes. you're incorrectly addressing him the incorrectness of the predicate means the incorrectness of the proposition so the proposition is this is socrates okay so once again the the, the, the part where he's mentioning the incorrect addressing this is an accurate the mistaking look of the approaching person as Socrates and uncorrected addressing. That is an accurate description of what Plato says in the Theotetus. The next statement, incorrectness in the predicate means an incorrectness in the proposition. That is a tautology taken from Aristotle that is nowhere in any of this. It's not Plato. It's brought in, it's brought in uh, to, to, to try to connect, right, the, the previous inc incorrectness with another incorrectness. Incorrectness of addressing, an incorrectness of the predicate, an incorrectness in the proposition, there's no connection that's been established between them whatsoever. The mm -hmm. thus, hang on, the thus in the next statement with thus Plato uh -huh. grasps, there's no thus there. There's no, there's no syllogism connecting the previous two statements to the Plato grasps the essence of the pseudos as the uncorrectness of the logos of the proposition. Even if, he, even if Plato grasps the essence of the pseudos as uncorrectness of a logos, which might even be true about the internal dialogue of the logos, it still wouldn't reduce to of the proposition because the whole point of the internal dialogue thing and the internal judging of, uh, of things you get in Plato and what the Logos means in Plato is precisely that the soul as the sensorium of being is reaching out to try to actually make contact to and judge of the beings. So, so Heidegger is judging the what Plato is doing at this point is uh, that Plato is grasping the essence of the uh, pseudos as the incorrectness of the logo. Based upon what? Based that he's when, when someone says, when, no, no, no. When someone says thus at the beginning of a sentence, it's supposed to follow from the previous sentence. And this doesn't follow from the previous sentence. Pure math. It doesn't, right? Incorrectness in the predicate means incorrectness in the proposition. Thus, but if you're saying, well, Plato is uh is that meant are you, are you trying to tell me the incorrectness in the predicate means incorrectness in the uh, proposition is meant to be a minor that is connecting the pre, the, the the failure of addressing with uh with the with the uh, uncorrectness of the logos because it doesn't well he he's in a syllogism he, you need common terms and there aren't any here the three statements he, have no terms in common he he's saying that the what, what plato mistakes as the archer where he misses the mark is that he's using uh, the uh, he's uh, he's it's he's missing the mark by deciding that the person in front of him is uh, Socrates or not based on using uh, whether the proposition he is so this is Socrates is correct or not. You think that the proposition and involved is saying, the proposition, that's a you, you, no, no. You think the proposition involved is this is Socrates, and you think Socrates okay. is the predicate. Well, the question. So we were talking about there's somebody walking towards you, and yes. they're snub nosed and googly eyed. Yes. Is this Socrates or Theotetus? Correct. What is the missing of the mark? According to the whole discussion of forking we got in the previous section, what is the missing of the mark here? that you would decide that based no, no. on I'm sorry. the- I'm sorry, credit. you have to go back to the actual book we just read, right? There's an actual description of this levels of forking and the actual way in which you, in which you miss by, by looking past one, one thing to another thing, right? Where in that is this, right? What is the passing by? The passing by is that I, intend what what is the intended object of the judgment is it theotetus is it socrates what is the intended object of the judgment to, to know who's in front of me this man here right yes okay what is the passing by i'm trying to judge of this man here what is the passing by what am i passing by I'm holding to Socrates and a passing by of Theotetus. So that's right. just a way of expressing, well, I'm, 
Uh, this is Heidegger's words for what he's trying to say, right? Right. Uh, whole, what is being held to as a Socrates, the holding to a Socrates is a passing by a theate as a passing by a theatetus, right? So the the the, uh, the the intended object of the judgment is this man here, and I am holding to a Socrates and passing by the theatetus. Okay. Plato Pl Plato says I'm doing that on the basis of the fact that they share an idea, and because all that they shared was the idea, I can be mistaken in my existential predication about them. Yes. Right. That is the opposite of saying that I made an error about the predicates I ascribe to them. It's saying I can be entirely right about all the predicates I ascribe to them, and I will still make the wrong existential judgment if the only thing I have to go on is a set of predicates. Plato yeah. is saying you can be right about all the predicates and still be wrong about the existential predication. That is the exact opposite of what, of, of what Aristotle is going to go off and claim. So, and the, the, this, you're saying that that would be the opposite of what Heidegger is claiming here. No, I, I, I'm saying that, that that is entirely in keeping with, with what Heidegger said about the nature of the forking as the, as the phenomenology of the actual uh, situation in being considered by both of them. The actual phenomenology of it, I, I think Heidegger's description of, what, uh, of the situation and of Plato's understanding of the situation is entirely accurate. Just none of the rest of the stuff he's saying here follows from it at all, because what he's saying about it is precisely that you can have all the predicates right and you can still be wrong in the existential predication because the existential predication is not simply uh, is not simply talking about predication. The existential judgment is trying to go beyond that and reach out to which individual being. And Plato is agreeing. Socrates is agreeing that we are trying to judge of the of the actual individual being, and all, when all we have to go on is a set of concepts, and the and the individual being is not those concepts, of course it can err. Yeah. So uh, again, not leaving aside the fact that after he's maintained all this, Socrates is then going to say, and by the way, we can also err when all we have is is pure ideas, which he's about to say when he gets brings the math example. Right, Le leaving that aside, which would undermine even this claim, this is the only essence of untruth, right? Even in the case that Heidegger is focused on, Heidegger is not claiming that this is an error of predication. He's well, not, right. claiming, yeah, he's yeah, not, he's claiming, not claiming it's an error of predication. It's... Nor, is he, nor is he like, see, someone like uh, 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 Descartes would claim that it's not an error of predication, but it is an error of logic. Would claim that you're, you're, you're assuming that something follows that doesn't follow. And you stuck your neck out too far, and you made a judgment as to per, as to the person coming towards you, and you should have stuck with saying this one, this person appear, uh, coming towards me appears to me to be stub nosed and googly eyed. And if you had just pulled your neck in that way, you wouldn't have been exposed to error. Descartes could say that, but Plato isn't. Plato is saying stick your neck all the way out and risk being wrong. Right, but the. So let, let's say it's an uh, AI that's checking the video feed of what's coming towards it. Okay, if the AI has a soul that is a, a, a sensorium, let me finish. It, it, it can predicate. Pete, Pete, right. I'm not asking about predication. The, the question is, is this AI that is trying to do this, uh, does it possess a soul that is a, a sensorium of being that is aware of all the common uh, greatest kinds and can can uh, can and does reach out to try to judge of being and non-being itself in its internal dialogue? And in doing so, is this AI uh, trying to be uh, 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 trying to reach being even if at the risk of being incorrect, or is it just trying to be correct? It's just trying to be correct. It's trying well, to. Well, it's just trying to be correct. That it's not the Plato. Being, it's not what Plato is describing here, because the person Plato is describing here is not just trying to be correct. The person Plato is describing here is trying to judge of the being or non-being of the of the individual per person approaching them, and they're not trying to avoid incorrectness. Socrates is trying to explain the inner possibility of incorrectness in this situation, and he is tracing it to the fact. That you're trying to judge of the being of an individual particular coming towards you when all you have to go on is retained ideas and those two things not being of the same order of one another of course you can err in it he's not giving you a formula of how you should avoid that error he's not even claiming that error is something to avoid he's just saying that because those two things are of a different order for exactly this forking reason that heidegger has explained that error is possible in the matter Yeah, so what Heidegger is saying that 
if you uh, say that the truth of the person walking toward you is based on the correctness of the uh, predication, the truth value of an assertion, that that is not true. And he's ascribing so no one, that but, but, to but, but, but no one. But no one is saying that here. Plato isn't saying that here. But that's all. what Heidegger is saying. What, what is what Heidegger is saying? Because Plato isn't saying that. Heidegger is. Can you find uh, any place in Plato where he talks about the truth value of assertions? You can find it in Aristotle. You can find it in Aristotle, yeah. You can't I, find it in Plato. Right, but, so, but that's, I mean, so Heidegger says at the end of the paragraph, Yes. But yeah, in Aristotle, it's there. Yes. And we don't disagree about that. But now Heidegger is making... Back, back, back to Rosen, which we brought in for exactly this reason, right? We, we all agreed that there is a doctrine, a doctrine of truth as correctness of propositions and of uh, 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 thought itself as being purely interior to the mind and of ideas as being purely interior to the mind. And by the way, of time of being purely interior to the mind, all of them in Aristotle, which Heidegger at times has, has, has criticized as the subjective turn that takes all these things that are an attempt to be a middle that's reaching out to things and turning them into just, category, just properties of the subject. But the whole thing we got in the entire allegory of the cave and the whole first half of the book was precisely the fact that Plato isn't one of those people. Plato is one of the people who says that you're reaching out and that ideas are actually outside there and that there is a middle between uh, where, where the mind makes contact with things. And then the whole first half of, uh, of, of this dialogue, that the, that the soul is the sensorium of being that makes direct contact with beings noetically and judges of being and one and the other highest kinds, uh, judging by itself independent of perception. All of those are very different from Aristotle and you never find them in Aristotle and Aristotle is disagreeing with them on every page. And Aristotle is inventing all of his doctrines about these things just being abstractions and just being interior to consciousness and ideas just being in the mind precisely to get away from all that Platonism, right? All that Platonism is the place where Plato is sticking his neck out and saying the mind is capable of error because the mind is actually trying to judge of external uh, objective truth. And all it has to go on is seemings. If, all, if, if, if from the fact that all you had to go on is seemings, you deduce that therefore you should, you should remain in seemings all of your days, you'd be Descartes, not Plato, right? Plato is saying that the seemings are the way that you make, <clears throat> pardon me, are the way that you make contact with truth, right? But they're also capable of error. The fact that they're capable of error doesn't mean you run away from them. There is no, you know, there's none of that here. So again, all the, 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 the criticisms that, uh, not even the criticisms, the subsequent historical developments that Heidegger is focused on are all things that come out of Aristotle, not Plato. And his attempt here is to show that they're already there in Plato. He has not shown that they're already there in Plato because every time he gets to the point of, of doing so, he either puts it off to the next chapter or when he doesn't have any chapters to put it off to, he gives you predicate italicized at the end of the line and uh, incorrectness of the proposition just asserted, and he cites Aristotle, not Plato. Yeah, so, right, so, that's so, not so true. I, 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 I get your point that the the evidence is, is not there clear cut in Plato. He doesn't say it explicitly, but that's what Heidegger is inferring. Uh, yeah, pretty heroically, if you ask me, because back when he's actually expl explicating uh, uh, Plato, he says things like these dialogues are inexhaustible and nothing is there is there without being for a reason. And, you know, he's the he's the first and last person to engage across, uh, in, in this problem and to uh, walk this stretch of road and you know, et cetera. All very flattering, all very, you know, uh, you know, and his expo exposition of the phenomenology that he's seeing in Plato is right along the lines of what he himself thinks and what uh, what you would get from uh, Husserl on the, on the point. Right. So when he's being expository, the criticism isn't there when it comes time for the criticism. It's Aristotle in from left field and uh, single words at the end of depend dependent clauses that don't even have a verb. And that's not reasoning. It's assertion. He's just asserting it. He has not shown it. Right. And, and so he does say in the Plato's Sophist that in order to understand Plato, yes, 
we got to read we, we first <coughs> we first have to decide that he's aristotle yes right uh, otherwise we just have a you know it's just so, like a play so uh, this and this is and this is and thinking that when we have a play we just have a play is it may, may be a, a a problem with him not understanding the form uh, for which he should read Schindler. But uh, on, the, on the idea that uh, the, the best way to understand uh, Plato is Aristotle who, uh, who figured out all the things that he had done wrong and fixed them. Or he says that, them explicitly rather than- I'm implicit, I'm, 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 I'm ascribing something to uh, uh, Heidegger with uh, even more charity than he shows to Plato. Um, uh, uh, when he's doing that, he's just uh, repeating the same errors of the, of the uh, the, the, the late uh, interpreters of Plato and Aristotle in the late ancient world who tried to assimilate them to one another and pretend they never disagreed with each other that are you know adequately exploded by people like John Philoponus who proved that mm -hmm. no, 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 they're actually disagreeing violently, right? So, sorry, Plato is not Aristotle, Aristotle not, not Plato. Now, he, he may want to say, and I think at other times he does almost get, uh, come to say that the, uh, um, the importance or impact of this is all all came from you know uh, what happened to it after Aristotle. But this is not Heidegger, and it's certainly not Plato. It's something more like Hegel's uh, 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 history of the spirit, where there's only it only gets to be one uh, one uh, uh, spirit of the times that gets to move through all time, and that there, and that cuts off all the influences of everything before by assimilating them, and so that only the things which uh, which which survive the th next thing along matter, as though you know Plato goes away as soon as Aristotle arrives, and and uh, all the influence that Plato has is only the influences that he had on Aristotle. But I'm sorry, that's that's a that's a Hegelian philosophy of history, not uh, not uh, an analysis of Plato. Yeah, I mean, so. Uh... I, so also involved in this is that, you know, af, after a, a Aristotle, we still have the Epicureans, and then we have the Neoplatonists, mm -hmm. and then it all disappears. And then Does the, well, the Arabs in Baghdad, you know, keep some of the texts and the Byzantines keep some of, but in Europe it disappears. Uh, all, all Does texts it disappear? Do. Did we read Scotus Eugenia? Well, that, that's later, that's- uh, Well, when, for, when, yeah. when, when specifically are you thinking of then? Oh, well, uh, when Alaric sacks uh, Rome and the, you know, the, the Roman cities collapse, and literacy disappears from Europe. No, not not in not in the Byzantine not in the Byzantine Empire, which keeps. No, not in that way. That's that's you know way off in the that's, east. That's not way off in the east. That's the set. That's half of the Roman world. It's the Greek half of the Roman world. Well, well so in, in those terms, I mean, so in terms of uh, European terms, we have the Dark Ages and the Renaissance. When all that comes back, sorry, right? that's, you, you just jumped ahead way too far, right? Well, um, well, you, you were telling, you were telling that you're telling me that, that it all disappeared because, uh, and when I brought up Scottish well, okay, Eugenia so, in the so, Middle Ages, to show that it didn't appear, disappear in the Middle Ages, you 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 uh, uh, wanted to jump back before him, so he's he's too late. So by the time we're you know at the successors of Charlemagne, we're way too late for this. So whatever Dark Ages happened, it has to happen before about 900, and at that time Byzantium is flourishing. And I'm sorry. Right. Okay. okay. So the way I'll put it this way: uh, that for for a thousand years there was the philosopher Aristotle. I'm sorry. And no. His books are the ones that the Arabs translated, and Plato had kind of disappeared. They had a couple dialogues in Baghdad, but it was only when. Um Farab, for, 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 for Abi writes a, a, a precis of all of Plato's works. He does. Yes. Okay. So okay. So my. Uh, yeah, it's not true that they only had Aristotle, not remotely. Uh, it is true that they thought that some things, which were works of Neoplatonists, were works of Aristotle, and they therefore underestimated the degree of difference between Plato and Aristotle. Sure. They had lots of the late commentators on Aristotle, and they had some things which were uh, uh, works of Neoplatonists circulating under the un, under a, 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 an Aristotle byline that led them to think that the Platonists and the and the Aristotelians were closer to one another. But there's tons of Neoplatonism in in the in the Arab East, and there's tons of direct contact with uh, with Plato himself in Farabi, for example. Um, okay, so I, I, I've been, uh, I had this mistaken assumption 
the Plato kind of disappeared until he was rediscovered in the Renaissance. Yeah, that's not true. And not, not only that, most of, most of theology in the West is Platonist, not Aristotelian, down to the time of Aquinas. Right? It's the, it's the, 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 the Neoplatonic church fathers in the East and people like uh, Augustine in the West, who's a Platonist, right? right. Uh, who, who are the who are the uh, the linchpins of, of theology in the West? It's not until it, the, the uh, Aristotle comes back through the Arabs, through Averroes, into the Latin Averroes, and then into people like uh, um, um, uh, Albert the Great and um, and Aquinas. That's a reintroduction of Aristotle into Europe. But for before then, uh, Aristotle was you know barely read in the West for a, a long period of time. He was read for his logic. That's what he was known for. The organon. Yes. Uh, but so uh, Saint Augustine, he's actually reading Plato and not just the Neoplatonists. So. He was taught by a Neoplatonist, but yes, he obviously also read Plato. Okay. Good. I. I I, I recognize the Neoplatonism in them. Uh, sure. But so getting back to this, I, I, I think. Uh, I mean, we'll leave aside that we, we, we can leave aside that the influences, the influences of later history. The, my, my point about the influences of later history is only that both Aristotle and Plato have independent afterlives in Western philosophy, both in the East, uh, like the Arabs, and, uh, and, and, and in the West. Um, and a very varied one with lots of different cross influences and attempts to synthesize and whatever else, right? It is certainly not the case that, Arist that uh, Plato's only impact after Aristotle came through the lens of how he was understood by Aristotle. There isn't even any gating event after which that is true. That's right? just Heidegger. <laughs> I think it's just the, uh, um, it's the attempt, it's a Hegelian philosophy of spirit kind of attempt to reduce the main line of Western history to a single narrative. And much of that you get in both Hegel and you get especially the, the, the role of Socrates in that from Nietzsche. We'll get to the whole diagnosis of, uh, of um, uh, the role of Socrates in nihilism or something uh, when, when we get to Nietzsche, but the, 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 the picture of that, which sees a point of decline a point of sharp uh, hyper-rationalism as, as a motion of decline in Socrates specifically, you get primarily from Nietzsche. And uh, as for uh, the influence of uh, on later philosophy being primarily uh, uh, th um, by or through Aristotle, that's the kind of thing you might get in a um, uh, in a Hegel, but even Hegel will bring in the Neoplatonists after that. Right, and we'll think that the Neoplatonists are, you know, a summation of the wisdom of the ancient world or something, which he's revived. He himself is reviving. He's way less down on the Neoplatonists than Heidegger is, so to speak. Um, but the, uh, I, I, how much of this, how much of this uh, diagnosis of the particular uh, uh, turning point not being uh, Aristotle is, you know, I, I just think, think it's a matter of historical accuracy thing. It's not a particular take from a particular person. Nobody was putting the brake at. Aristotle, because no one was putting the linchpin event as the coming up with the doctrine of truth is correctness. That's Heidegger. Heidegger is the person who's saying truth is correctness is the turning point. But if truth is correctness is the turning point, then the turn then the turner is Aristotle, not Plato. In my opinion, right. And Heidegger is saying, no, it happens at this point in the Theaetetus. Yeah, and um, I, I just, I, I just yeah, say it's not, it's not, not proven. Plato certainly doesn't say it. If I, if, if I were trying to make an argument that was there, I would reason it very differently than this. I would, I would uh, uh, accentuate that stuff where Plato talked about uh, uh, the interior dialogue of language um, or something like that. Uh, I, I still would have, you would still have the problem that the the whole dialogue is not even trying to be a. Um, uh, a fundamental teaching about the uh, only possible source of untruth, um, and certainly not the part about the difference between uh, the perceptual and the noetic as being the only possible source of that, because uh, as we saw, he also uh, um, locates possible error purely in the noetic. The, the dialogue as a whole is primarily dealing with the, um, the Protagorean position that is trying to maintain something like Truth is fundamentally a matter of an origin point in perception, 
That's what the actual mark of truth is. Does, does the truth have a hall pass that originated in a perception? And if it does, then it's true. He's a, he's, he's a, a relativist empiricist. And he, he wants uh, uh, what, uh, whatever appears to, uh, to, to some mind to count as truth. There's, there is a, a allegiance of Protagoras to the notion of truth as appearing in that, that Heidegger is sympathetic with, but the dialogue as a whole is intensely critical of that because it doesn't think it is a sufficient criteria of truth. But the, the way in which Protagoras and the whole dialogue is attacked or taken down um, by, 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 by Socrates is not uh, based upon some, uh, uh, that he is insufficiently logical or insufficiently focused on the truth, of, the truth occurring only in the proposition, like uh, an Aristotelian might have as a criticism of him. The, the criticism of, of, of Protagoras in the dialogue is not that he is not yet um, an Aristotelian logician, right? That is not at all the criticism of Protagoras. The criticism of Protagoras is that he uh, denies the, the, the phenomena of the difference in knowledge across human beings, that his argument refutes itself if, 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 if assumed to be true, and that to the extent that there is truth in the notion that uh, uh, something like uh, perception is central to truth, it is not sensory perception, but noetic perception. And noetic perception of the common in particular is a proof that there's something like the soul that is something like the sensorium of being that is, um, uh, that's, the, that's the salvable truth in, in, the, in the Protagorean notion that uh, um, uh, to, to perceive is to know, right? That's the only solvable part of it from uh, from the standpoint of the uh, of the dialogue. Okay, so I'm just I'm just saying what I think Plato is doing there. What Plato is doing there is not primarily trying to make this turn. I don't think Heidegger even says that he's trying to make this turn. He's trying to say this turn happened here, unthought, right? Because something was left behind because it was, you know a possibility was not explored or something. Um, not that it was Plato's intention to do so. Plato's actual intention in the dialogue, though, is to take on the, the, the Protagorean ancient relativism position. And from his own point of view, he's doing that by contrasting the life of the philosopher with the life of the sophist, first and foremost, and, uh, and whether or not one of them has a true attachment to truth or the other. His, his Socrates' his diagnosis of the sophist is they're only attached to truth for the sake of its, of, of, of its rewards, to put it in the, the terms of the public, right? And that's why they engage in this uh, relativism because they're flattering the jury, jury, right? They're flattering the jury of uh, all men by telling them they're all judges of the truth. And Socrates simply rejects the flattery. He doesn't consider it uh, be flattery to tell him that he knows everything because he knows that he doesn't and he considers it an imposition, right? So th that's the actual structure of the uh, and topic of the dialogue. And in doing that, Protagoras is also steelman as much as possible, and he's put in a whole camp of which he's only representative of all the fluxists, of all those who say that all is change. And the, the core thesis that Socrates is fighting against, that he identifies those fluxists, is they all say, we should just stop saying being at all because there's no such thing. He's trying to save being. He's trying to save connection to being. He's very much in that Heideggerian project. And he's, he's, he even mentions uh, 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 Parmenides as the only one who took the other side against all the fluxus, right? But uh, Plato is trying to take the side of the, there is a soul's connect, uh, connection to being against those who say, all we have is, 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 is becoming and a, a relativistic uh, uh, mirror show, something like that. That's what uh, um, Plato thinks the dialogue is about. So I don't, I don't see the turn that Heidegger uh, needed to show either in the dialogue or in his reasoning about the dialogue. And uh, I also see that, the, uh, that he kept putting off the proof of the claim later and later. And at the end, he's very clearly just running out of time in the lecture course. Maybe he had something else he you know, uh, planned to do there, but he, he clearly never had time to do it in this book at least. And he picked the text and he picked the pacing. Right, so uh, if he's got a case, um, it's in the Scottish not proven column to me. Yeah, he, he's certainly missing the textual, you know, this sentence in Plato uh, yeah. is where it, 
Whereas first, if I if if I if I look if I look for the sentences in Aristotle, I can actually find them. Right. right. If I look for places where Aristotle maintains that uh, truth is fundamentally about the uh, content of the proposition, and the con the, the uh, truth and propositions, you know, uh, as you know, this this logical requirements and all all the rest of it. Um, I can find the truth is correctness doctrine in, in in Aristotle, and I can even find it along with the uh, with the claims about the um, uh, interior subjective nature of this whole realm of thought, something like that, that uh, that Heidegger wants to criticize as a as a as a closing off of some element of uh, contact with being. I think that he does think that there still is that contact of, uh, with being, as Dan says, in 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 Aristotle. Aristotle is still you know awake to those things. There's places where that that that, that peeks through. It's certainly there in the metaphysics as a whole, right? Um, the, the the wonder experience that he makes much of in basic questions, right, is 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 there in Aristotle. But if 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 the if the road taken that leads to uh, the uh, uh, the veiling of truth as unveiledness is truth as correctness, then the person whose fingerprints are all, all over it is Aristotle, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, the 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 there's, uh, Heidegger's inferring that it's in Plato, uh, but it, he doesn't have any proof that it's explicitly in Plato. All right, now let me just pop my reason why I harp on this so much, right? If this were a small thing, if it was a minor point of intellectual history was all that supposedly turned upon it, then it might be okay that the evidence was thin and it was assumed and you know something like that. This is not a small matter. The claim here is that there is something fundamentally unthought in the history of Western civilization that is the uh, uh, that is a corruption in the core of the structure of metaphysics that is leading it towards an inevitable collapse of Nietzschean nihilism, or something like that. And if 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 the uh, conclusion from that is that a, there is a need for a new beginning, refounding philosophy back to the Greeks, something like that, then we're going to conclude these staggeringly huge civilizational consequences. And I am not willing to uh, conclude the staggering civilizational consequences from an italicized word predicate stuck at the end of a, a, a dependent clause that doesn't even have a verb in it. That's not sufficient reasoning to overthrow Western civilization. Yeah, and I mean, when, when Western civilization did, did pay Heidegger's salary and put a man on the moon and stuff. Yes. Uh, so it. I mean, I think the reason Heidegger returns uh, to the beginning of Western civilization uh, is that besides paying his salary and putting a man on the moon, there's a sense that it's missing something. I agree. Uh, I agree. That's and, why he, he thinks that there's something uh, that, that modern civilization is uh, Western civilization, especially modern Western civilization, is missing something, especially modern Western civilization since Nietzsche. Uh, but how far back we can uh, we can we can debate uh, uh, that it is missing something, and that something is something like uh, uh, direct openness to being, understanding of being, caring about being, caring about the truth of being, caring about the event of the appearing of the truth of being, etc. Right? We uh, uh, and and those these are all things that we should definitely consider. I haven't seen that those things were absent in the sense of wonder and and uh, uh, apparatic, you know, investigation of all these things in in Plato. Uh, maybe Heidegger does see that there. I don't. But uh, when we go to what that problem is, I think we're going to see that what that problem is is something more like a philosophical connection to the issues themselves, especially the biggest issues themselves. Does Plato lack that connection? I deny it. I think he has it. So uh, if 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 we're going to uh, go back to the beginnings of Western civilization, I don't think you have to go back past Aris, uh, past Plato. I think you can go back to Plato. Um, so uh, if to the extent that uh, uh, some reviv revivifying uh, dr uh, drafts from the uh, from, from the original wellsprings are necessary, uh, I'm all for uh, uh, ha having the pre-Socratics be involved in it. But uh, I'm going to insist upon Plato being involved in it too, um, and maybe even Aristotle. But, and I think that Heidegger himself is proof that that is necessary because that's what he does in his own activity, right? He does not ignore these people. He's clearly learned things from them. Um, so 
and taking Dan's point about the, the fairness that he has towards that one in, in the exposition, I think that Heidegger himself acknowledges that. Okay, so if there's any you know, grand refounding involved, right? Uh, it's not uh, the usual cartoon. What do you mean by the usual cartoon? The usual cartoon is metaphysics as a structure is a structure of error that must be overthrown because metaphysics at its end because it's impossible, because it was wrong from the beginning, because Plato set it up wrong, because what's wrong with, with metaphysics is Platonism and Platonism is the error of the West that needs to be overthrown. Right, and that that is something which assimilates a position that you kind of find in Heidegger, with a position you definitely find in Nietzsche, and turns them both into a blade, which is trying to uh, uh, take out the root of Western civilization. Right, and so where Nietzsche actually thought uh, Socrates got it right, but Plato corrupted it because he Nietzsche let Socrates on the pre-Platonic philosophers yes. are good and then Heidegger but, kind but, of, but, no, it's but, pre-Socratics it's Socrates well but but uh, Nietzsche does not think that it's okay with Socrates and 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 uh and only goes wrong with Plato uh, on the contrary in 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 uh birth of tragedy right he blames Socrates for the murder of tragedy in Athens right that, that, that's a few years after he lectured on the pre-Platonics Yes, but the the the, the point yeah. is that uh, the point is that in in in, in Nietzsche, uh, the the, the pre-Socratics and especially Heraclitus, um, uh, come off just fine, but the uh, but the Socratics, including Socrates himself, do not because um, of tragedy, which yes. Heidegger is not that interested in. Because of tragedy, and also because for uh, for uh, um, for Nietzsche, the fundamental issue that tragedy only exposes is he died, what he diagnoses as a hyper-rationalism that uh, nihilistically dislikes the world as it actually is and therefore cannot face the tragic because that involves chasing you know, something like uh, bleakness of life or something like that, the tragic aspects of life, um, and is therefore going to try to improve reform and whitewash reality. And that is a denigration of and uh, uh, undermining of reality. Uh, the undermining of the of the apparent and the undermining of the real and the devaluing of the real are the same thing for Nietzsche. So he 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 diagnoses in rationalism itself a hatred for what is, right? That it, he thinks is at the core of nihilism, and uh, he, he and he sees that as beginning in the hyper rationalism of Socrates. But that's precisely because he's not talking about connection to being. He's not talking about openness to being. He's talking about a evaluation of optimistic or pessimistic about something like life or, uh, or or truth, reality, human reality, something like that. Do you say yes to what is, and put it in the terms of, uh, of the later Nietzsche, and he thinks all the rationalistic moralizing judgments of what is don't su say sufficiently yes to what is. They don't say yes to the seamier sides of life. They want to do away with it, right? They want to reform it. And uh, to the extent that uh, reality needs to be reformed, you're thinking that reality is insufficient in itself. And that's not enough love of fate uh, for, the, for the fatalistic uh, uh, Nietzsche, right? But we can, can get into all those aspects of Nietzsche. None of those are Heidegger's reasons, right? And, yeah. and, and it's, it's striking that with, when, when he doesn't agree with any of those Nietzschean reasons, that he would agree on a, on a, uh, uh, a Nietzschean conclusion. Right as to where the turn happens, right? On to me, relatively thin, well, not relatively, extremely thin evidence. Right. right. So you're arguing that you know uh, it's really the the fulcrum, the pivot point of history is in Aristotle, and so we should talk about the pre-Aristotelian philosophers. I and I, I, I do I do not. I do not maintain this claim, but that's because I do not maintain that the place where uh, uh, Western civilization is fundamentally derailed is when it believes that there is a correctness notion of truth. I think a correct notion of truth is just part of the notion of truth that is actually both correct and unveiled and discovered. Um, and that uh, uh, the unveiled notion of truth and discovery notion of truth is necessary and is important, but the correctness portion that Aristotle has uh, also explicated very well is also part of truth. 
and Aristotle to me is not a uh, a wrong turn. Aristotle to me is a someone who made uh, wonderful progress on uh, important philosophical mm -hmm. topics, none of which need to close down uh, connection to uh, uh, truth as aletheia or to the problem of being or anything like it. So right. I, I don't I don't locate uh, any error in Aristotle, but that's because I don't think that uh, coming up with a correspondence theory of truth is some fundamental wrong turn. Right. So so Heidegger. Uh, is not necessarily saying Plato bad person, Aristotle bad person. Uh, he he's saying that definitely in Aristotle the correspondence theory of truth is there. The yes. problem for us today is that that's all we have. We've lost discovery. Oh, I agree with that, but I don't think that it's Aristotle's fault that we, if we've lost. It's discovery. not. It's not his fault, but that's where it's not all discovery, there's now also this correspondence theory of truth. I, 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 I understand you saying that. I understand you saying that. But I, I, first of all, I deny that it was all discovery before Aristotle came along. That's the first point. Okay. Um, second point, I think that uh, uh, both Aristotle and Plato are great for our notion of wonder and discovery. Um, uh, to the extent that there is something like a falling away from direct connection to um, truth of being going on in the West, to the extent there is something uh, going on in the history of Western philosophy, which is something like a motion towards nihilism, I can see some of that, but I don't see it where Heidegger sees it. He, I think he's got it way too early. I think that there are elements of it in the thing which he diagnoses as um, Descartes limiting the scope of reason in order to avoid error, not sticking its neck out sort of stuff. Um, thinking that if I only subjectively report my uh, uh, experiences and the ideas in, uh, the, in my experiences, then I won't stick my neck out and make a, make a judgment. Um, and that that is a, a pulling in of the ambition of truth to make contact with reality, something like that. I think that's a fair criticism of, of, of Descartes. I don't think that's the only place that it happens, but I think that's one place where the subjectivist turn in modern philosophy gets going. Um, I think that there is still um, uh, a connection to truth in uh, Kant. Uh, I think it's uh, it may be uh, some aspects of it may be turning it into problems. I think there's a, uh, a, an attempt at a connection to truth in, in Hegel, although I think it goes in, a, in especially from some of his own historical influences on him. Uh, and in, I think there's even one uh, attempt at one in Nietzsche, although I think he is the one who most comprehensively goes off the rails. But if, if there's a, a place where we end up that looks like nihilism, I think it's uh, uh, in a complacency of thinking we don't have anything to learn about these questions, first of all, and in a declining spiritualism of, of any of it, and a declining ambition to make con a connection to a truth we didn't invent in all of it. Um, and I'm sympathetic to some of Heidegger's diagnosis of those things. I am much less sympathetic to much of Nietzsche's diagnosis of those things. And I think anyone who sees that as being a anything like a rampant pro uh, problem in Greek philosophy is just wrong. It's it, the, the opposite is all over Greek philosophy, including uh, 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 Socrates, Plato, and 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 Aristotle. Um, I think that they are a a wonderful antidote to any of that. Um, I think all of those things are way more recent, modern, and if you pardon the expression, historicist diseases. Um, then uh, uh, and you'll find way more of them in. Uh, German philosophy, especially German philosophy since uh, its idealistic turn, um, especially the historicist turn in it. Uh, and that's more likely to be the place where you're gonna find uh, uh, some of those problems. Uh, I also think that some of those problems were diagnosed even in the Socratics. Uh, some of those things are um, rebirths of some of the uh, relativisms and subjectivisms and sophistries and uh, uh, flux philosophies that Plato was fighting against in his own time. I think that there's that there's elements of Nietzsche that are just straight Heraclitus, and there's elements of both that are you also find in the Protagoras of the dialogues and the Callicles of the dialogues. I think there's elements of uh, either a Nietzschean or a Machiavellian realism cynicism that you find in Thrasymachus and so, so on, right? So I, I don't think that the Platonic universe or the, uh, for that matter, the Aristotelian universe of what these types are is remotely past. I think it's a w they're, they're way more accurate guides to even our contemporary philosophers and our contemporary problems than uh, most probably do. Um, so anyway, those are my own, my own, my own positions on those things. Uh, I, I 
one of the things I like about Heidegger is that he does engage with these things seriously. And when he's doing his actual exposition of what these philosophers thought, he's generally accurate and fair. He's also you know, deeply insightful about them, obviously. And he also can bring to them judgments about um, uh, his own later discoveries where he can see uh, uh, things that might have been that, that wouldn't be apparent to someone who hasn't seen as far as he has. Um, we can talk about his own positive stuff yeah, as well, but the, the, um, the basic diagnosis of an unsoundness in the original beginning, I, th I find him relying far too heavily on Nietzsche's periodization and history of Western philosophy. And he's not nearly skeptical enough of that. Um, he, uh, he is adequately skeptical of Nietzsche's other uh, outcomes and teachings in other respects. Um, but I think he is way too beholden to him, uh, uh, trusting of him in his assessment of those things. So sorry, well, he, 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 he puts too much trust in Nietzsche assessment of what? Of the uh, history of Western philosophy as developing nihilism or as automatically culminating in well, where he well, came well, out. Well, Right, but so so Nietzsche's, uh, you know, he it, to him the big event is the move from paganism to monotheism. It's right. earlier than that for him. It's earlier than that for him. Rationalism is sufficient. Yeah, but I mean, he, I, I, yeah, I guess from reading, uh, he goes on about that a lot. Nietzsche Heidegger doesn't seem to care too much about. Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche is aiming at something that um, um, the monotheistic civilizations and the Greek rationalists actually have in common that he regards, he Nietzsche regards as the, the sort of basis of idealism, which is a distinction between the true and the apparent world that sees the true world as more perfect than the apparent world and wants to reform the, 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 the apparent world in, um, uh, in the light of the cast on it by the true world. And he sees that uh, that general structure as being central to metaphysics and as being something which you find in common in the monotheistic uh, traditions and in the Greek philosophy of the Socratics and Aristotelians, right? So I think that there's elements of that which are fair and seeing that as being part of the nerve center of Western civilization, right? That that point where the monotheistic traditions and the Greek philosophers agree with one another Right and and that metaphysical structure, I think that Heidegger is a very good um, expositor of of that uh, metaphysical structure and its and its role in history. I think the Nietzsche books in particular uh, lay that out very well, and I think he's partly indebted to Nietzsche for that, but he's also just indebted to he's just original in his own understanding of that historical structure from the depth of his understanding of each of the of the periods of Western philosophy themselves. But now, and, and that's that. That to me is, is Heidegger's single greatest contribution. Well, there's some great contributions by being in time, but one of his great contributions, at least, is is that understanding of the of that historical structure of metaphysics. But behind that is a is a Nietzschean motivated diagnosis of that structure as a nihilistic error, right? And and that understanding that that structure itself is a nihilistic error, I find uh, Heidegger simply taking over from Nietzsche uncritically. Right, so, so would it be fair to say that uh, he Hegel's the first person to say, oh, there's this whole history there that explains where we are today and where we're going. And then Nietzsche comes along and says, yes, there's this history there but you, Hegel, got it all wrong, and I'm going to explain it uh, in different terms of tragedy or monotheism. And then Heidegger comes along as the third one and just says, oh, I have a different interpretation from Nietzsche's. But it goes back to Hegel saying, you know, history is the, the important thing to understand to understand philosophy. Yes, the, the idea that there is a history of the spirit and that that history is a fundamental thing to understand, to understand uh, uh, Western philosophy. I do think that's 
a Hegelian thesis. There are some precursors that are much less philosophical, much less deep than, than Hegel for, for those ideas and people like Herder and so forth. But I think that they're, they're, they're ephemeral compared to Hegel's version. Um, I think that uh, Hegel's version of it is a, uh, an optimistic one about both West, about civilization and the possibility of knowledge. And Nietzsche's uh, is a, uh, a, a debunking reaction against that as a, as a, as a um, uh, Panglossian whitewash, something like that, right? Um, and uh, that, that, that takes away the, the, the tragic confrontational and oppositional nature of that history. He's it, not seeing that history as a fight. Right uh, and and uh, wh which Nietzsche does, right? Um, so Nietzsche recasts that entire history with uh, instead of the rise of something like the uh, um, uh, the liberal opinion state, something like that, as being the arrival of of, of, of reason and God on earth, uh, which is what you get in Hegel. Um, uh, he's seeing it as something more like the uh, the um, uh, the last man, right? The 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 the, the mm -hmm. loss of all weight and seriousness and things and, and so on, right? So uh, and as nihilism, right? So that that's that's the uh, he, uh, Nietzsche is consciously turning Hegel upside down in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the valuations put on these things, while still seeing a, a similar historical structure. He's he's turned he's turned it upside down, and and Heidegger criticizes Nietzsche for that. He says that uh, says that Nietzsche remains in, in meshed in metaphysics because he's just turned it upside down. And that means it's entirely indebted to it for a structure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And that's one of the reasons I want to go to the, the word of Nietzsche essay, because he does bring out some of those ways in which he is critical of uh, of Nietzsche and all that. Um, but is does uh, does Western the history of Western philosophy still appear to Heidegger as that structure of metaphysics? With something like the Nietzschean valuations on it, I put it to you that it does. Well, so um, so, so you certainly Hegel is saying it, 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 history is really important, and it's a progressively getting better history. Uh, the, but it's it's primarily the issue that it's, it is a progressive intellectual history in which one yeah. one position succeeds another according to an unfolding uh, intellectual logic of the positions, and Nietzsche then says no, it's the different passions, the different philosophers, and the different fundamental drives they had uh, 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 pushing them in this way and that, and the one fundamental drive they all share in common is their dislike of the world as it actually is, something right. like that. Um, <laughs> But the point is, one of them is seeing uh, uh, reason and philosophical reasoning in it, and the other one is seeing passions, the passions of philosophers in it, um, and that's why it's it's an inversion of the the, the height direction that, that is supposedly going on in it. Mm -hmm. And and Heidegger is saying uh, there are roads not taken and all of that. There are, it, it is a it is an it is an intellectual um, uh, spiritual uh, journey, but the fundamental spiritual journey in that is is there a connection to being in it or not. Right and and the, the being being progressively eclipsed and uh, the the connection to being being lost and all that. So he's telling a he's telling a a, a fall version of that story. And, uh, and so he takes that from Nietzsche that oh it all went wrong at the beginning. Uh, he takes the fall structure, but he's not he's not giving the passion reading of it. He's not saying right, the right. He, he but but he uh, and he's almost reversing he's almost reversing. The the the, uh, the the moral weight on the attachment to anything like a transcendental in it, because to, to Nietzsche, attachment to anything like a transcendental is a devaluing of what is and is and is and is the uh, the, the the error he's trying to avoid. And for for uh, Heidegger, uh, some kind of uh, uh, attachment to being is the uh, man's calling, redeeming thing about man. And he, if it, if anything, he is trying to rehabit rehabilitate that sort of spiritual side of things, which makes it all the more confusing that he would accept Nietzsche's diagnosis of the whole tradition, because he does. He, he, both, he, both, he both wants to reestablish something like a, an independent spiritual uh, 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 connection to transcendent truth, and when that is exactly the thing that Nietzsche criticizes as nihilism, he is also accepting much of Nietzsche's criticism of Western civilization as, uh, as that sort of nihilism. Right, and so from Heidegger's point of view, you can see in the early Heidegger being in time that he sort of seems to blame Descartes for where it all mm -hmm. went wrong. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, five years later, 
he's now pushed that oh the card mm -hmm. is just another step mm -hmm. but it goes all the way back to plato mm -hmm. and uh, and he's going to keep pushing until we have another beginning right uh so in, in in the in the early Greek thinking book, right? It's it, at first they're they're a a a way more direct uh, 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 set, a way more direct um, approach to the Aletheia notion of truth, but then it's also still not quite uh, 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 being itself talking, right? It's just the different ways in which people uh, people have responded to being in the in the history of spirit, and they haven't been conscious of this, and and the uh, uh, directly letting being speak or something is the is the is is the new beginning, something like that. So uh, they're, they're, he, he likes them better, but they're still part of the, of the, of the, um, the first beginning that didn't go in the right way. Yeah, and then, I mean, there's definitely a sense of it's all gone downhill. Uh, in Introduction to Metaphysics, he sort of says Indo-European was the pure mm -hmm. language. And we were, the Greeks already lost something. But they had the aorist and these other yes. moods and yes. the, 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 the language, which is the house of being, has all the actual insight in it, and the and the and the different eras and nations and philosophers just miss some of it. Yeah, and we just keep reducing it down to uh, simpler and simpler simplest. formulas that we can pass around like footballs. Right, and 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 we lose what was uh, essentially important. And now that we have to make machines understand us, we've lost, we're, we're just down to the correspondent. The, prop, the prop, propositional, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 and, but that down to is in the direction of a declining spiritual connection to the, uh, uh, the, the tremors of language calling us to, you know, actual uh, experience of being itself, something like that. And uh, that's what's being lost. What's being lost is a, process, a progressive, if I can put it this way, despiritualization and uh, with specifically intellectual spiritualism, right? And that's what's being lost. Fine, but where, where is that being lost the most? In the most moderns and in people like Nietzsche, right? Even if they're doing it also diagnostically, where is it, where is it least lost? And people like Plato, who are you know directly uh, talking about uh, uh, the connection to that transcendent truth as being what the soul is capable of, in in the dialogue we just read, right? So uh, the 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 person at the, the people at least removed from it are the people earliest in that tradition that have the most sense of wonder, and the people at most removed from it are the people like Nietzsche, whose diagnosis he is trusting. And, and so Nietzsche then is the counter enlightenment figure where the enlightenment is with rationalism we get more and more light on everything and we understand everything better and better yes and nietzsche's the one who turns against that and says no uh by pursuing rationalism we're losing stuff the more we go down the sure. enlightenment the more we're losing, we no longer understand the darkness, if you will. Uh, yes, the darkness and the low. And then he has he has wonderful wonderful uh, 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 lines like that. Uh, the, the problem with uh, Plato is that he could not believe that the pure and sunlight gaze of the philosopher could have arisen out of lust. I wonder if you ever read the symposium, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> leave, 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 leave that aside. There's lots of stuff we can say about Nietzsche. I, I think we're, we've, we're making the case that the essay we have to do next is the uh, is the is the word of Nietzsche essay, right? At least I, that's where I'm going, because I, I think we have to understand what Heidegger thinks is at stake in this question. <laughs> um, and 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 to me, the best introduction to that is uh, the word of Nietzsche essay from this book. Um, okay, and where's that from originally? Where's that from originally? Right, because that's uh, just a collection, Harper Collins. Uh, of course, of course. I mean, it was. I think it was in the book that you mentioned in terms of where it was in the German. No, uh, so that one has who is, is not Zarathustra. Okay, that's different then. No, this is. Um, so is it just in the Nietzsche lectures, or did he publish it earlier? 
So I think, I think it's later. But... So so what is it? The word of what's uh, the... So this is uh, Heidegger's own gloss on it is that a major portion of this were, deli were delivered repeatedly in 1943 for small groups. The content was based upon the Nietzsche lectures. They were given in 36 to 34. Um, but the point is, it was, he says he, he gave it to small groups in, during the war. It was only presented, it was only published after. So what was the title of the essay again? The Word of Nietzsche, God is Dead. <laughs> Oh, it's in uh, Holzwege. Okay. Uh, right. So, so, so that that means this is one of the dead ends. The high was it was was published in fifty two, right? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I don't have that here. It's essays from thirty five to forty six, and Nietzsche's Wert Gott ist tot. Yeah, that's uh, it. Yep, forty three. He's yeah, got it down. All right, so so it's in the unbeaten paths to the an alternative translation. Yeah, I'm I'm good with doing that in two or three weeks. Yeah, I think that that'd be great. Um, because I mean, the, the the fundamental subject here is um, uh, something like modern nihilism. Where does it come from? What is it about? And uh, uh, Heidegger's own. If you're going to say take on it to, be, to being blunt. Um, uh, let's look ahead for a second. Um, I would prefer to do this on Sunday the 11th, which would be four weeks from now, if people could do that. Sunday. The 11th Wait, of December. 11th of December. I, I think I'm good there. I don't have anything at the beginning of December. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, okay. And it's 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 short enough, we can do it in one session, I think. Um, it's on the order of 60 pages. Um, uh, page 53 to, yeah, yeah, 60 pages basically. So I think it's a it's a uh, you know, get get the collection because we will we'll probably also read the question concerning technology out of this. Um, but uh, if you have it in some other form, that's fine. Uh, but the the word of Nietzsche essay from this is what we want. It's it's a, a, it's a, it's a, different cover, but it looks like the same book. Uh, do you want to just look at the table of contents and see what essays it has in it? Yeah, I think it's uh, William Lovett. Yeah, that's the right. That's the right translator. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the same as the green book. It's just I think the so. cover. By the way, there are some of these uh, printed versions of the green book which aren't as good as the one I think Craig has because they um, uh, just some of the um, the appendices to the age of the world picture in this are misprinted. They're not there. There's like elements of another book in there instead. That's not true of every every uh, edition of this. But you can find versions of this where, like the last 40 pages, instead of being the appendices to uh, the age of the world picture, like they're supposed to be, are just like, you know, uh, random things from some other book that doesn't isn't by Heidegger at all and just has no reason to be here other than a misprint. Um, they're talking about, you know, Buddhism, voodooism in, in, in 1920s France and other weird, <laughs> other weird things about how to make jambala and whatever um it, it's just completely weird it's just like nothing to do with the, the subject at all it's a complete misprint but uh so if you get craig's edition you're probably better off um all right i, I want to give uh we i've been monopolizing a ton of conversation with all these uh, uh you know um my own claims about things um and uh, uh i i think the conversation with pete has been great um but i want to give other people a chance to ask their questions and uh 
uh, jumping with their own comments. So I got a question that's maybe a little bit off track, but, uh, but I'm looking for the connection back to uh, Max Weber's um, Sciences of Vocation, where he brought up the term disenchantment. Yes. And I see the sociologist and, uh, and psychologist making uh, big hay with uh, re-enchanting and disenchantment and all this kind of stuff. But I don't see that anybody's taken the, the path to cross over between the philosophical stuff we were doing with uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger and the sort of sociologist, psychologist stuff that they do with disenchantment. Uh, is there something that bridges that that you're aware of, or is it kind of done in parallel paths? I, mean, I think there's definitely connection. Uh, I, I can't, uh, uh, there's places where there are um, single chapters and other books talking about it, especially things uh, we're talking about um, uh, Max Weber in the early 20th century um, uh, and, and some of his influences uh, and influences on him. I mean, uh, um, uh, he was definitely heavily influenced by Nietzsche himself. Um, the, some of the stuff we'll talk about in the in 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 the in Nihilus essay deals with something like that disenchantment um, uh, issue, um, but the uh, um, uh, what what is the line in in uh, is, is it in science vacation the iron cage um, uh, uh, voluptuaries uh, uh, without uh, uh, sorry um, specialists without spirit and voluptuaries without heart right is the is the his diagnosis of, of, of where people are going with they uh, lack anything like an actual connection to the truth. Um, so there is this connection to truth aspect of it. There's also um, sharing a bunch of Nietzsche's diagnosis of last man. There's a bunch of um, the concern that uh, Weber had to make social science value free, which was based upon him being extremely impressed, perhaps overly so, with uh, Nietzsche's um, values relativism. Uh, he thought that um, if, if it were proven that um, something like the underlying values uh, uh, completely determine the nature of, the, of, of one's research, there would be something unscientific about it. Um, he, he, uh, he was definitely worried about um, whether or not there is a sphere of the common in which there is a true or there are only the, uh, the, the different cultures and the different experiences to them. That's a, a concern about how social science can react to something like a a Nietzschean critique of its assumptions. Um, so uh, in terms of people who talk about this, uh, uh, it's talked about in some books on um, Weber specifically, um, Weber and Strauss, Leo Strauss, um, Weber and Vogelin um, discussions often bring up these, these, uh, these things together. Um, uh, Weber himself is trying to stick to a uh, not strict to, he's trying to hold on to a, um, a value of enlightenment rationalism while he is more or less convinced that Nietzsche has understood something fundamental about the nature of culture. And he doesn't know how to put the two of those, those two things together. Um, he sees the contradiction between them. He sees the devaluation of, of reason in Nietzsche and is not willing to go there. Um, but he sees um, insight about the, uh, way in which culture and subjective assumptions use and, and uh, uh, structure interpretation that he thinks are uh, just psychologically accurate, something like that. Um, and, and, but he re regards that as a threat, to the, a threat to the possibility, a threat to be resisted to the possibility of objective science, something like that, um, especially in the human sciences. Um, so uh, uh, I don't think that Weber himself believed that he had navigated all of those tensions, you know, um, but, uh, and, and viewed that situation as tragic. The other person who can cite there as influenced by both of them would be Spengler. You get the same kind of um, uh, assumption that the future of the world will be about techniques and about uh, 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 um, expertise and no longer about culture and cultural production. Um, uh, and they're both heavily influenced by Nietzsche and they both have a similar, um, they're convinced by him without it liking the fact that they're convinced by him, something like that. Um, so that Spengler may be another point of contact. Um, but I think that that's mostly independent. It's just Spengler is in a parallel situation to, to Weber. It's not that he influenced Weber or vice versa, um, but they're both reacting to the same cultural environment. 
I don't know if that helps. So, in, in effect, things started with um, work, you know, kind of came out of Nietzsche, but everything sort of post Nietzsche and the philosophical side doesn't seem to get any attention in the people that are dealing with Weber and such. Um, I think I think it I think it does sometimes. I mean, the the um, another way to think about this is that. Um, there's a whole set of reactions to uh, Hegel in the 19th century. Marx's reaction to Hegel and Nietzsche's reaction to Hegel and, and Kierkegaard has a reaction to Hegel. Um, Karl Loeth has a good book on From Hegel to Nietzsche that talks about some of these. Um, but the, 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 the point of all that is there's various different critiques of something like um, uh, a triumphalist, in, triumphalist enlightened rationalism running around in the 19th century. And people like uh, uh, Spengler and people like Weber are all influenced by that the the um and so sort of the psychologists the uh what what weber shares with some of that is that he he agrees that the direction in which uh that prior understanding either in hegel or in marx is missing something essential is this is the realm of spirit he thinks that they're 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 they've undersold spirit they've, they've undersold um the uh, the, uh, the spirit and the um the, the moral side of not just the of, of intellectual life something like that and that's why the the there's the interest in psychology um uh but uh some of that is uh there's a cachet from uh coming from uh Kierkegaard as well Kierkegaard is, is treated as uh the expounder of a position that the that the uh social scientists you know cannot criticize in in, in Weber at times um uh and so is the Marxist so he, he's treating these different anti-Hegelian positions as being fundamental worldviews that can't communicate with each other, but that have assumptions of what is important that are uh, that are sealed off from each other, um, something like that. Um, but if you look at the typology of things that he mentions when he's thinking of that kind of case, they're all different reactions to Hegel, right? Um, and his own his own um, predilections, his own uh, sympathies in all of that are um, a spiritualist criticism of Hegel as uh, being too rational, too rationalist to actually explain the world, something like that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that helps, but I mean that, that 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 those those tensions were definitely going on in in German academic intellectual circles, especially on on the center right, even although Hegel is really not Hegel, uh, Weber is really center left uh, at that time, I would say. Um, but uh, th there's a there's a there was a divide in. German cultural politics, I can put it that way, that those who emphasize the economy were the modernizers and those who emphasize the spirit were the conservatives. Um, and to, to view the role of material forces and politics and uh, economics and history as being driving and determinative was typical of the left. And to view uh, uh, culture, psychology, religion as being essential was, was, was typical of the right. Um, and so anything that up that played up the importance of mind was viewed as being uh, on the conservative side of that divide. And Weber is most famous for bringing out that in sociology, right? Bringing out the importance of those spiritual things in sociology, um, sometimes even beyond the facts. <laughs> um, but uh, why, why would he be interested in doing that? Because he, he's 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 trying to undermine the notion that purely economic forces divorced from anything like the history of spirit are uh, the sole drivers of history, right? He's worried about a reductionist history that's going to, uh, Marxian fashion, reduce everything intellectual and and uh, psychological to being a mere epiphenomena of the economic and material. And so, you know, when he gives an example like the Protestant ethic, right? He's meant to be. He's trying to show that causation goes in the other direction as well, right? That from the from the spiritual to the economic. Um, yeah. Sorry, Joe, comment. Yes, I had a question and clarification. Uh, I was I'm up on Amazon on the other screen, and we're talking about. I'm looking at the book that has the black and white cult cover. Craig, can you hold your you copy? Know, up? Say again. I'm, I'm looking asking, at Amazon. I know. I'm just asking Craig to hold up the book so you can see it because that's the one you're looking for. I think. I'm looking at it on the screen. I can't hold up the screen. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's just the black. It's the book black and white questions concerning technology. Yes. Heidegger. Uh, unfortunately, this Amazon page doesn't display more details like translator, author, and stuff. But I don't. I use. I'm okay. just seeing that. Does it have is a look inside? Book? Huh? What? It probably is, but does it have a, a look inside? No. 
Okay, no, me... for some reason, for some reason, those features which I expect to find aren't here. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Just um, let me let I, me look. Somebody it flashed it up on the screen. The black and white. You had the blue one. I I can't find the blue one. Uh, mine was green rather than blue, but uh, uh. Yeah, the sixteen dollar one is the one that I have. Fifteen ninety nine. Yeah, with the yeah. with the with the black and white cover that says black and white cover looking yeah. like a spotlight okay. kind of thing with a little. Okay, I'm going to add that to my cart and move with it. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't buying something I would not need and have to reorder. No, it's, it's, a, it's a fair, perfectly fair question. Um, thank you, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's not an interruption. It's great. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, Craig, I don't know if you if I helped you on the Weber stuff, but yeah, that's good. It just sounds like uh, the path that Heidegger has sort of taken here, and some of what we're seeing in terms of what he's taking through that hasn't come back into the conversation that the sociologists and others uh, need to be having. Um, I mean, the, the 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 psychologists were certainly heavily influenced by Heidegger, not necessarily on this, um, not necessarily on this uh, uh, nihilism disenchantment question, but more on the. Um, uh, the existentialists in in uh, and life world discussion in psychology, right? And and you get a, a different line of um, influence, if we can put it that way, between the the sort of um, life world analytic of Dasein being in time stuff through Merleau Ponty and all that kind of stuff into uh, psychology perception and all of that influencing uh, psychologists, um, as well as you know some of the problematics of uh, being in time, uh, you know, um, um, being towards death and all that sort of stuff in in some of the existential psychologists. Um, so that that has had a, a separate, I put way, independent stream into those parts of the social sciences. I don't know how much the sociologists have taken from that, as opposed to the psychologists. But the psychologists certainly, there's a whole bunch of you know mid mid century psychology that's heavily influenced by that, including, you know, people like Eric Fromm and so forth. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't know if that helps, but that's to me independent of anything like a, a Weber angle. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious because I'm also seeing, you know, as I think Joe's seen a little bit of Popper, some of the yes. work of philosophy of science um, and the foundations of science, which was why I thought of patterns of discovery by Hansen seems yes. to be dancing around the same topic that Heidegger was dancing around here. Yes, the other place where there's definitely influence of where Heidegger influenced stuff on um, history and philosophy of science is especially people like Thomas Kuhn um, and uh, structuralism and understanding scientific revolutions that way. A lot of that is indebted to um, both Husserl and Heidegger uh, in, in, in various ways. Um, and the, the 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 metaphysics structure that he laid out is a, a paradigm of a of a historical structure for uh, the, the structuralists in history generally. Um, that was taken up by some of the French uh, structuralists before Kuhn, and then Kuhn tried to apply it to specifically history of science as opposed to the other things that people had applied it to. Um, but so there's a there's a structuralist connection there, if you get me. Um, Okay. Um, these are these are fine questions. Uh, I, I want to um, give people a chance to react to the whole the whole reading. I know you've gotten too much of mine, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll be quiet about mine. But I want to know your guys' reactions to the the whole course of reading the Theotetus and the uh, Essence of Truth book together. Go ahead, Dave, Joe. Oh, Joe. Okay, I will wait after Joe. Is Dan talking or am I? Joe. Go ahead. Go. Joe, uh, I go. see Dan's name up there. Okay, I, I enjoyed very much. Uh, I mean, I thought that Heidegger's um, uh, writing of the book itself like, was fairly uh, difficult to read because my eyes didn't adjust to that odd, slim typeface that his book has. <laughs> and um, but I enjoyed uh, plowing through this equipment. I mean, this 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 uh, territory because these are the questions that go to the center of where you know what do we believe we what do we believe and why do we believe anything about it? And what's the difference between empiricism and theoretical stuff? And I just love exploring the perimeters uh, around that topic. And this was a very good exploration. I'm looking forward to the next uh, thing about technology fits right in. And so thank you very well, much, Jason, for leading these groups. 
Great. Well, thank you. I mean, the, the particular essay we're going to read is in part two of that, The Word of Nietzsche, God is Dead essay. We will probably come back to read the Question Concerning Technology essay, but not right away. Well, wait a minute. Um, did I just order a book that we're not going to go immediately next well, to? The, we, you did order the right book. That book just has multiple essays in it. There's multiple chapters in it, basically. I want like number two. You want the you want part two, which will be the third essay, The Word of Nietzsche, okay. God is Dead. The the okay. usual parts are uh, part one has questions concerning technology and the turning. Uh, yeah. Part two has Word of Nietzsche, God is Dead, and part three has the age of science, sorry, age of the world picture and science and reflection. Um, I trust you will remind us uh, as yeah. the. Uh, I'll put it on I'll put it on thing, but basically the middle of the book, part two, about sixty pages. Part two. Okay, I'll start. I'll start at part two and progress toward it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Very just, much. just distinguish part two from chapter two because it's all as confusing as possible. <laughs> I do understand. I do. Yeah. Uh, sorry, thank Dan, you. you wanted to give a reaction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for leading the group, and I really appreciate that and enjoyed it. So regarding this book, I think the it's parted with this, and the, the especially as Heidegger goes back to to I don't know Heraclitus, Parmenides, and others. I find that understanding Greeks is 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 essential, and I don't I don't understand that. So I need to take Heidegger at his word, whatever his. And his his interpretation of Greek is quite different from from other interpretations. So probably, I I found this even in this book that I need to take Heidegger that has it word whatever he sees there it's it's there and it's quite different that everyone else is and that's that's one 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 big challenge and I I, I decided to go with Heidegger more or less like. Uh, yeah, when you're talking about the meaning of Greek words, I think that he's a very good guide, and I think his reading of Greek words is often better than other people's reading of Greek words. When you're talking about his assessment of Greek philosophy, well, we'll have to. Uh, he's worth definitely worth considering, but I'm not going to take him simply as a, uh, as the, the last word on Greek philosophy. But that's me. But Kari, go ahead. And then uh, you know, regarding this entire issue that you you especially you and Pete argue against uh, each other, and it's like. Um, Heidegger is claiming that some, like everything starting with Plato is, 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 is under his influence. Like even Nietzsche, when he's saying that there is no truth, that God is dead, and everything that like there is no being, that it's just a puff of smoke and so on. It's basically Heidegger, that's, that's, that's Plato. Even if it's, it's an extreme form, it's still Plato. And everything that started with Plato, with ideas and so on, it's, it's so, so deep and it's, we cannot think still outside of that. And he's trying kind of to step outside. It's not just truth and aletheia and correctness and so on. It's, a, it's an entire world view. And he's, to me, for example, these days, that's one of the most difficult things. I, I, I get some glimpse, but it's, it's so difficult to step outside and see what's, how, how is to look at Plato from outside. And it's, it's so difficult. It's, I, I see glimpse there and there and, Especially in the, I remember the contributions to philosophy and this book, the questions, mm -hmm. I, there are some where Heidegger, but it's so difficult to get a glimpse. And to me, that's kind of like, I think Heidegger, what he's doing here, he's trying to, 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 to accuse Plato on the theory of truth, but actually I think he's doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a larger perspective and it goes much deeper and it's, it's quite difficult to step outside that and, and see it. And to me, that's kind of the, the, the big issue. And well, you know, I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you that it's hard to step outside Plato, and I agree with you that even people reacting to him are kind of in, under his influence in that regard. I mean, and I think Heidegger is right to point out if someone sets the problem in a certain context and sets it a certain way, that that has an influence far beyond people just you know agreeing or disagreeing with him. People, the people disagreeing with him, but they're using the same terrain are influenced by it, and and, and that's that's fair. Uh, and I across agree with you that it's hard to step outside of metaphysics, certainly. Um, Talk about how desirable to step outside of metaphysics. That's a different question. But sorry, go ahead. Keep going. No, I, I think that's that's. I was trying to say. And I agree with you. If you try to find specific instances where you, you, you I don't know, you, you say Plato is wrong, you cannot do that. You, you probably, if you, if you want to do something, you need to step way, way outside that perspective. Like specific instances, and you, you need to somehow step outside Plato and Platonism and everything. And it's, 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 it's quite difficult, but. If you if you look for specific points to to to, to hold against Plato, it's very difficult. And probably you are right that Heidegger didn't do a good job in in this. And he's trying probably to to to, to do something bigger. And then 
try to, to gather some arguments and he failed to gather those specific arguments against Plato in this book. But I think that, that there is something that he's, he's trying developing there in the background long term against Plato and probably I think that it's great that we, you want to go and read the, go in that direction and read like this essay and so on. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, I just want to say I agree. I agree with you that I, I think the fact that he didn't fully make his case in this book doesn't mean he doesn't have a case. I think he is going somewhere bigger, and I do. I, I want to follow him as he as he goes there. I think honestly, in this one, I think he was planning a big lecture course, and he ran out of time. I think I think the the the, the last portions of this book don't have nearly the depth and clarity of some of the beginning parts, and I see that a lot of his lecture course things he just runs out of time sometimes, and uh, he's got to get get to it the, in the next book. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, just saying, I'm, I just started like off the beaten track of a few weeks ago. So I was just uh, to reread the, that essay on, on Nietzsche. So that's great for me. Okay. It's working if it's well and yeah. Yeah, okay, so that, that's great. Um, uh, I want to just give a little pre bit of preface of, of, of what to uh, look at, think out of the book. I mean, obviously we've talked about a bunch of it here, but the, 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 the fundamental assessment here is Nietzsche has this view of Western philosophy as um, culminating in nihilism. And we can think of nihilism as a contemporary problem, and we can also think of it as a grand sweeping movement of Western history. And we can think of it as a, diag a contemporary diagnosis of a grand sweeping movement in Western history. Those are sort of three different levels on which to take it. Um, but all three of those are kind of the commonsensical or Nietzschean view of it. There's also Heidegger's view of it, right? Heidegger thinks that there is something like uh, such a grand sweeping movement going on in history but it's not Nietzsche's version of it. It's his own version of it. And pay attention to the different voices and the different levels, because there'll be times when, when um, uh, Heidegger is explicating what Nietzsche is saying about the history of the West. And there's times when he will be uh, you know, saying, saying, this is what nihilism is. Um, this, oh, sorry, this is what Nietzsche says nihilism is. But there's other times when he's gonna be saying, this is what nihilism actually is. And it's not gonna be the same thing, right? So Heidegger's understanding of nihilism, Heidegger's understanding of Nietzsche, Nietzsche's understanding of nihilism, um, all of them are in play. And this is a this is a a, a multi-voice text where you have to pay attention to the shifts of where he's just explaining what how he thinks Nietzsche sees something, and uh, uh, and where he's saying how he thinks the thing actually is. Um, I think this essay. That's is all we're going to find in the part two of the uh, new book. Yes. 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 Um, this is also meant to be just a, you know an explication of uh, of the of this uh, the, the the famous God is dead line from Nietzsche, um, and how to read or understand that. Um, I th I think that there is, uh, to, if I can put in a, a a punchline to look for, does Heidegger think that Nietzsche might be right in some of the diagnosis, in a sense of the term that Nietzsche himself would not have imagined, right? Um, so that's that's uh, where I think we might be heading. The point is that the the the, the, the if it's if the right word is punchline, the pun the punchline of this essay is not obvious on the surface. It's a it's a it's a twist. I'm telling you this essay has a twist. So uh, watch for the twist. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, all right. Uh, uh, I think we're at four, and uh, I'm going to uh, stop recording and, uh, and invite you guys to uh, join us again next time. Um, it, it's uh, 11th of December, uh, the Word of Nietzsche essay. Pete, do you have one last comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say it's also been translated in this book. Okay, off the beaten on, track, yes. Off the beaten track, and this is it was translated 20 years after the one in the green, black, okay. and white book. Yep. And so I just want to say that's also available uh, as a translation uh, if you want to read that one too. Yep. Uh, it might be closer to Heidegger's intent than the original one. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, partly underline that by saying when I read whenever I'm reading uh, Lovett's translations, I want him to like stop putting in the supercilious footnotes. You, you feel a little bit like you know uh, you're you're um, uh, you're watching a, a a stirring performance masterwork of Beethoven's Ninth, 
and there's someone who's jumping up in the in in, in the theater pit and say, saying he got this from from Debussy, right? Whatever you know, and you know it's just some complete off the wall a historical claim that you know you don't need you know and and you know. Um, or this 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 one showed up in the who right um, and you know, I didn't need that right now right so yes re, re, pay pay little attention to the footnotes when you're reading the Lovett translation I think the translation is probably fine but the uh, when it comes to he's trying to explain Heidegger's concepts for you that he thinks you're not going to get um, don't assume that his level of understanding of Heidegger is that great um, it's often an, a, a it's not quite Kaufman level but sometimes the interjection is just not needed. Um, Okay, but uh, it's, it's it's what we have. Um, so if you want to try exploring the the, the translation in the uh, off the beaten path book instead, uh, you're welcome to. I'm going to go with this one because it's what I have. It's what I read. All right. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a good night.